What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omnisensei. Welcome to, What If I Was in Marvel as Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse, Part 11. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. As the group stepped into the dimly lit undercroft, the portal snapping shut behind them, they found themselves surrounded by an eerie silence. Everyone's attention immediately turned to the assortment of cells embedded into the cave wall, each holding a different villain from various universes. Before anyone could say or do anything, Peter waved his hand, conjuring a portal beneath Sandman's feet. Ugh! The villain grunted in shock as he dropped. The trapped villains watched with curiosity as Sandman was deposited into a cell next to them, enjoying the bewildered look of betrayal that filled their neighbor's face. Sandman banged on the glass of his cell, his frustration evident as he thrashed and shouted. The other villains glanced at him, some chuckling sarcastically. Eddie Brock, his maniacal grin widening, taunted, Welcome to the party, Sandy. Looks like you're in good company now. Doc Ock chimed in with a smirk, Seems like our little gathering is growing by the minute. Quite the reunion, isn't it? The only one who wasn't saying anything was Norman Osborn, who seemed to be in some sort of brain fog, like an elderly man with dementia. W where am I? He kept muttering to himself in confusion. As Sandman continued to protest and bang on the glass, Tom turned to Peter with a shocked expression. What are you doing? Let him out. He surrendered. Peter's gaze shifted from the trapped villains to Tom, his expression filled with exasperation. He shook his head, rolling his eyes at Tom's request. I understand that he surrendered, but we can't afford to take unnecessary risk. Sandman was obviously a villain in his universe, and neither of us can guarantee that he won't turn on us. Tom's face contorted with conflicting emotions. He understood Peter's reasoning, but a pang of guilt washed over him. He had promised Sandman that they would work together to send him home. But we made a promise to him, Tom argued, his voice laced with uncertainty. I can't just betray his trust like that, Peter sighed, his gaze shifting back to Sandman, who continued to rage inside the cell. I'm not saying we won't help him, but it's best to keep him safely detained while we figure things out. He's not a scientist, nor is he a master of the mystic arts who can help us send everyone back. We need to prioritize everyone's safety. Tom's conflicted expression remained, but he could see the logic in Peter's words. He glanced back at Sandman, whose shouts had turned into bitter insults. I knew I shouldn't have trusted you. Let me out. I'll freaking kill you. The guilt weighed heavy on Tom's shoulders, but he knew he had to make a difficult decision. Reluctantly, Tom nodded, his voice barely above a whisper. Okay, you're right. We'll keep him locked up for now. Sandman's shouts of betrayal grew louder as Tom's words reached his ears. He called Tom every name in the book, his anger boiling over. Tom winced, his heart aching for the man he had just fought against. But he knew deep down that Peter's decision was the right one. Peter stepped closer to Tom, placing a hand on his shoulder in a gesture of support. I know it's hard, but we'll find a way to help him. We just need to keep everyone safe while we do it. Of course, the underlying meaning behind that was clear. Peter wouldn't allow Tom to release the villains as his counterpart did in the movies, which subsequently lead to the death of his only living family member. But that doesn't mean they can't help them. Tom nodded again, a mixture of determination and sorrow in his eyes. I won't let Sandman down. We'll find a way to make this right. With a final glance at Sandman's raging form, Tom vowed to get him back to his daughter as he promised. A slash N. My man wants to send a villain with obvious anger issues back to his young daughter. What could possibly go wrong? Peter watched the caged villains in curiosity. Each of them a product of either their own idiocy or just plain bad luck, though hopefully they would be able to help. His attention, however, was soon drawn to Flash Thompson, the disguised Venom. Peter's suspicion lingered, and he knew he couldn't let his guard down. After all, Flash never joined them in the movie, which means either something simply changed to spark his decision, or someone behind him was up to something. Is it Venom or another villain? He wondered in interest. Unbeknownst to Flash and everyone else in the room, Peter discreetly cast a reverse protection spell on him, a precautionary measure to ensure the safety of everyone around him. 
The spell would prevent Flash from causing harm, freezing him in place should he attempt to attack anyone, while also keeping track of his movements. It was a delicate balance, as the spell had the potential to turn lethal if Flash's struggle surpassed a certain threshold of strength. Peter hoped it wouldn't come to that though. As Peter completed the spell, MJ, Aunt May, Lily, and the other Spider-Men came walking down the stairs. MJ walked up to Tom, her eyes filled with concern. Is everything okay? I saw the news and... I had to come. Tom gave her a reassuring smile, placing a hand on her arm. Yeah, everything's under control. We just captured another one. That's all. MJ's relaxed, a mixture of relief and guilt filling her gaze. I just wish that I could be out there with you. She muttered under her breath. MJ has always wanted to help Tom however she could, but recently, she found out that another version of herself was an actual superhero. Now, she wants nothing more than to get out there and fight beside her boyfriend, but sadly, that was unlikely to happen anytime soon. If not ever, Tom frowned, unsure how to comfort her. I need to find a way to do what Peter did. Toby approached Tom, a genuine smile on his face. You did great out there. I saw your fight with Sandman on the news. It reminded me of some of my own battles. Tom's face lit up at Toby's words, his admiration for the older Spider-Man evident. Thank you. Coming from you, that means a lot. Just as the group started to settle, Norman Osborne's voice broke through the tense atmosphere. Toby? Toby, is that you? Please, I need your help. A slash N. He would technically call him Peter, but we're trying to avoid confusion. Everyone turned their attention to Osborne, who appeared disoriented and lost. His voice trembled with confusion as he struggled to grasp his surroundings. I don't. I don't know where I am. I keep forgetting things. Sometimes I'm not myself, and whenever he's in control, I can't remember. I don't know what's going on with me. Toby's brows furrowed, his skepticism surfacing. He knew firsthand the manipulative nature of the Green Goblin, and he couldn't trust Osborne's words. Nice try, but I'm not falling for that again. The last time Norman tried that trick, Toby almost ended up skewered by a very sharp glider. He wouldn't fall for the same trick twice. As he was about to continue and warn everyone of the Green Goblin's manipulation, Aunt May stepped forward, her voice firm but compassionate. Spider-Man helps people, no matter who they are or what they've done. If someone needs help, then we should help, she reminded him, her eyes filled with unwavering determination. And he obviously needs help. Maybe they all do? Everyone looked around the room, eyeing the villains, wondering if she was right. Toby's gaze shifted between Aunt May and Osborne, torn between his better judgment and the need to help anyone that comes his way. After a moment of contemplation, he reluctantly turned to Osborne. I don't know if I can trust you, but if there's a chance to help fix whatever you did to yourself, to bring back the man you were before, then I'll do it. Osborne's face brightened with a glimmer of hope as Toby's words reached him. Please, you have to believe me. I'm not in control. Something's wrong with me, with my mind. Andrew, who had remained quiet until now, stepped forward, his voice filled with certainty. Gwen and I have cured the Green Goblin in my universe. If it's the same serum that's affecting Osborne here, then I might be able to help. We can try to reverse its effects, bring him back. Toby's gaze shifted to Andrew, his expression a mix of relief and gratitude. He nodded, placing his trust in Andrew's words. If you think there's a chance, then let's do it. But we stay cautious, just in case. As the group prepared to assist Osborne, Lily watched from a distance, her young eyes filled with curiosity. She tugged at her father's sleeve, drawing his attention. Dad, why are they helping the bad guys? Peter looked down at Lily's, his voice gentle. Sometimes people make mistakes or get hurt and they end up doing bad things. But it doesn't mean they can't change or that they don't deserve a chance to be helped. In fact, I've done this with a few people back home. For example, Abomination is currently an Avenger. What? Tom nearly jumper out of his suit, shocked to hear that the monster, who fought the Hulk and nearly destroyed the entire city somehow became an Avenger. How the hell did you manage that? As Peter gave him a brief explanation, Toby turned to Andrew. Do you have an abomination in your universe? He asked curiously. No. As everyone was talking, throwing out ideas on how to help Norman and the other villains, Doctor Strange paced down the stairs, an odd-looking cube in hand. The dimly lit Undercroft was filled with a tense atmosphere as the group of Spider-Men and their allies prepared to assist the trapped villains. Though their conversation was interrupted by the sound of approaching footsteps, Doctor Strange descended the stairs, his attention fixed on the cube in his hand. The room fell silent as he walked up to the cells, acknowledging the captives. Quite the collection you've gathered here, Strange commented, his tone laced with a mix of surprise and admiration. 
Impressive work. Um, thanks, sir. But Tom, eager to share their new plans, opened his mouth to speak. But before he could utter more than a few words, Dr. Strange waved his hands, drawing intricate golden spell circles around the cube. Beams of light shot out from the cube, scanning each villain and the Spider-Man before vanishing along with the spell circles. In a matter of seconds, the process was complete. A button rose from the cube, and Strange turned his attention to the gathered group. With this device, we can send each of you back to your respective universes. He announced, his voice tinged with authority. Tom's eyes widened, and he frantically tried to interrupt. Wait, Dr. Strange, we have a plan. But Strange paid no mind to Tom's word. He reached for the button, ready to activate it and send everyone back. However, before his finger could make contact, Tom managed to assert himself, effectively stopping Strange in his tracks. Um, sir, please listen for a second, Tom pleaded, his voice filled with urgency. We want to help them before sending them back. We have a chance to fix what happened to them. Most of them are already dead in their universe, so maybe we can save them? You know, change their fate? Strange's eyebrows furrowed, his patience wearing thin. Fix them? Change their fate? He scoffed. You can't change fate. Death is a part of life, and it is their fate to meet their end. It's sad, but it's the truth. Tom's determination only grew stronger as he stood his ground. But what if their deaths were preventable? What if we could save their lives by helping them now? Their conversation caused a commotion in the cells. The trapped villains, unaware of their own deaths in their respective universes, looked on with curiosity and confusion. Only Eddie Brock seemed to remember his fate, the memory of his explosive demise fresh in his mind. Strange, growing increasingly frustrated, moved to press the button again, only to find the cube missing. He turned to see Peter holding the box, a playful smirk tugging at his lips. Looking for this? Peter asked, his voice clearly provoking the caped master. Strange's eyes narrowed, his expression a mix of annoyance and exasperation. Hand it over. You should know the consequences of something this. He stated, knowing Peter practiced the same arts as him. Peter shrugged facing the famous sorcerer unwaveringly. Consequences can be accounted for and prevented with enough preparation and skill. Besides, we owe it to ourselves, and to them, to give them a chance at redemption. He declared firmly as he glanced at a proud-looking Aunt May. We can't simply send them back without trying to help. If we did, then we wouldn't be Spider-Man. Strange studied Peter for a moment, weighing his options. The dimly lit Undercroft crackled with tension as they faced off against each other. The other Spider-Men formed a protective circle around him, ready to defend their cause at any cost. Strange's eyes glowed with a dangerous intensity as he raised his hands, summoning mystical energy. You're making a grave mistake, Strange warned, his voice laced with a mix of frustration and determination. I'm sorry, but I cannot allow you to meddle with the natural order of things. Peter's eyes narrowed as his spider sense activated, the familiar tingling sensation flooding his body. Since he knew a fight was coming, he quickly stored the cube in his necklace, alongside his currently useless infinity stones. A slash N. He made a storage necklace a while ago for the stones, in case anyone forgot. With a swift motion, Peter drew upon the energy of the universe, conjuring a shield of golden light just in time to block an eldritch whip coming his way, hoping to grab the cube before it was gone. The shield crackled and shimmered, absorbing the impact as Peter held his ground. Tom and Andrew watched in awe, their eyes widening at the display of power. This was a side of Peter they had never seen before. Yeah, they've seen his portals, but that was it. This felt like real magic. Meanwhile, Tom analyzed the situation, seeking an opening to assist Peter. He knew firsthand the strength of strange abilities and understood the gravity of the situation. He had to act quickly. Without hesitation, Tom launched himself into the fray, flipping through the air and landing behind Strange. He unleashed a flurry of blows, aiming to distract and disrupt the sorcerer's concentration. Strange swiftly countered Tom's assault, making himself briefly intangible, allowing each strike to harmlessly pass through his body. All eyes widened as Tom's fists phased right through his opponent, especially the villains who weren't used to such mystical feats. Seeing that one spider wasn't enough, Toby and Andrew jumped in as well, bracing themselves for what would undoubtedly be a difficult fight. Dr. Strange, his eyes glowing with an otherworldly intensity, raised into the air with the help of his cape and conjured a swirling vortex of mystic energy. The air crackled with power as alien-like tendrils snaked out from the vortex, lashing towards the Spider-Man with deadly precision. Peter quickly covered Lily's eyes. I didn't know Strange practiced such kinky spells, he thought, knowing this spell was created by a certain hentai-obsessed master. Hey! Lily shouted as she tried to yank her father's hand away. I can't see, 
Toby, with his years of experience and battle-hardened instincts, was the first to react. He swiftly leaped into action, utilizing his agility and strength to dodge and weave through the onslaught of what appeared to be a dimensional octopus. His movements were fluid and graceful, reminiscent of a seasoned dancer, as he performed a series of acrobatic flips and rolls to evade the tentacles. Andrew, with his quick reflexes and sharp senses, followed Toby's lead. He moved with an unmatched speed, his spider sense guiding him to narrowly avoid each strike. As bolts of energy soared past him, fired from an odd-looking staff that appeared in strange hands, he somersaulted through the air, shooting his web shooters to create temporary barriers and leaping out of harm's way. Tom, the youngest and least experienced of the three, found himself struggling to keep up. However, his determination burned brightly, refusing to let his teammates fight alone. He used his web-slinging skills to create intricate patterns, attempting to ensnare and neutralize the monster that Strange summoned. His webs crisscrossed the undercroft, forming a thick, shield-like spider's web that provided momentary protection. But sadly, for them, Doctor Strange was a formidable opponent, his mastery of the mystic arts unmatched. He effortlessly countered their every move, using his magic to create illusions and distort the very fabric of reality. He warped the surroundings, causing pillars to appear and disappear, attempting to disorient the Spider-Men and disrupt their coordination. The battle raged on, each Spider-Man showcasing their unique fighting style. Toby's punches and kicks carried a raw power, born from years of experience and battle-tested strength. Andrew's moves were agile and acrobatic, his strikes precise and calculated. Tom, despite his relative inexperience, compared to the others, fought with an unwavering spirit, using his speed and agility to outmaneuver his opponent. The room echoed with the sound of clashes, the impact of blows, and the crackle of mystical energy. The Spider-Men fought valiantly, refusing to yield in the face of overwhelming odds. But with each passing moment, it became clear that Doctor Strange held the upper hand, his mastery of magic giving him a significant advantage. Peter watched the battle unfold, impressed by Strange's abilities. But it's time to end this. He knew it was time for him to step in. With a calculated leap, he propelled himself into the fray, his movements a blur of speed and agility. As he soared through the air, Peter focused his attention on the swirling vortex of mystic energy conjured by Strange. The tendrils of the dimensional monster lashed out, seeking to ensnare him, but Peter's spider sense guided his every move. He flipped and twisted in midair, narrowly evading the lethal strike. With precise timing, Peter shot a single eldritch coated web into the vortex, his web expertly stuck to the monstrous entity. And with a powerful tug, he yanked the creature out of Strange's control, causing it to dissipate into nothingness. The room fell momentarily silent as the Spider-Men and villains alike watched in awe at Peter's mastery of both combat and magic. Not wasting a moment, Peter disappeared in a burst of speed, his reflexes heightened by his enhanced spider abilities. He swiftly closed the distance between him and Strange, ducking and weaving through the illusory pillars that the sorcerer conjured in an attempt to hinder him. As Peter reached Strange, he leaped into the air, executing a flawless aerial somersault. In midair, he extended his arm, his hand gripping the odd-looking staff tightly. With a twist of his body, he wrenched the staff from Strange's grasp, disarming the sorcerer in an instant. With the staff now in his possession, Peter landed gracefully on the ground, his eyes locked onto Strange. He spun the staff expertly in his hand, smirking triumphant toward his opponent. Strange's eyes narrower with a mix of annoyance and disbelief at Peter's audacity. Without hesitation, Peter channeled Eldritch energy into his new staff, powering it up with ease. He expertly wielded the staff, firing bolts of energy toward its former owner. Each bolt was swift and precise, aimed to disorient the sorcerer and weaken Strange's defenses. The room filled with the sounds of pure chaos as Peter's strikes and bolts of energy met Strange's attempts at defense. The staff crackled with energy, its power amplified by Peter's skill and experience. Blow after blow, Peter dismantled Strange's barriers and shields, exploiting any gaps in his defenses. Ugh. Enough. Strange shouted in annoyance as he tried to fight back, but he seemed to always find himself on the defensive. Peter smirked, clearly enjoying himself. What happened? It looked like you were enjoying yourself before. As the battle reached its climax, Peter's movements became a blur, his spider instincts guiding his every action. He swiftly sidestepped Strange's last desperate attempt to counterattack and seized the opportunity to strike. With a powerful swing of the staff, he delivered a devastating blow, sending Strange crashing to the ground. Of course, Strange tried to once again make himself intangible, 
but that would never work against a fellow master. Peter simply coated the staff in eldritch energy, countering him with ease. The room fell into stunned silence as Dr. Strange lay unconscious, defeated at Peter's feet. Well, that was easier than I thought. He muttered as he tossed the staff into a nearby pile of junk. Of course, Peter knew that Strange could have used more, lethal spells, but refused since they weren't enemies. But Peter could have done the same, so he'll call it a fair win. Daddy that was so cool. Lily shouts excitedly as she rushes over, followed by everyone else. Before they arrive, Peter waved his hands, weaving a fairly complicated spell circle. Once it was finished, he slapped it down onto Strange, who twitched as it covered him and disappeared into his skin. Huh? Strange groaned as he began to stir from his sleep. Acting quickly, Peter grabs him, as well as his thrashing cape, and throws them both into a cell beside the villains. W what? Strange mutters as he wakes up in a cell, his cape bashing itself against the glass wall. What the? He mutters as he tries to phase through the cell, finding it impossible to wield even the tiniest bit of energy, eldritch or otherwise. The aftermath of the intense battle left the Undercroft in disarray. Peter took a minute to survey the scene. The defeated Doctor Strange stood confined in a cell, looking pissed off, his cape thrashing against the glass walls in futile attempts to escape. Peter's victory over the sorcerer sent shockwaves through the room, leaving the other Spider-Men and their allies in awe. Daddy that was so cool! Lily exclaimed, her eyes shining with excitement as she rushed over to her father's side. Peter couldn't help but smile at his daughter's enthusiasm. Thanks, sweetheart. He replied, ruffling her hair affectionately. The other Spider-Men approached, their expressions a mix of admiration and relief. They had witnessed Peter's display of power and skill, gaining a newfound respect for him. Man, he was tough, Andrew commented, a hint of awe in his voice. Tom nodded in agreement. I've never seen someone handle strange like that before. Peter grinned, the satisfaction of his victory evident in his eyes. Well, let's just say I've learned a few tricks over the years. The group's attention then turned to the captured villains, still trapped in their cells. Tom, lost in thought for a moment, made a move towards the cells, but Peter held out a hand to stop him. Not so fast, Peter cautioned, his voice firm. What are you doing? He asked, knowing what happened in the movie. Tom looked at him with concern. What? I'm letting them out. It's not like we can stay in the Undercroft. It's too risky. What if someone from Kamartage discovers that Doctor Strange has been captured? Peter sighed, knowing Tom had a point. If they stayed, then the likelihood of another powerful sorcerer coming along, either looking for Strange or not, was fairly large. Reluctantly, he nodded in agreement. But allowing them out of their cells would bring a whole host of problems. All right, Peter conceded. We can't stay here, but if we're going to release them, we have to make sure they won't cause any trouble. Turning to the caged villains, Peter eyes them with a dangerous, threatening look. But you won't cause any problems, will you? They all turn to own another and put on innocent facades. No, or course not, Doc Ock said, unconvincingly. Elector nodded along. Yeah, what he said. I would never hurt a fly, Lizard said as his long tongue shot out, aiming for a bug that landed on the glass of his cell. As each villain suddenly turned into innocent little angels, Peter turned to Tom and everyone else, finding them all just as doubtful as him. Yeah, right? Seeing that they couldn't be trusted, Peter approached each of the caged villains one by one. Norman Osborn, Electro, Doc Ock, Lizard, Sandman, and Eddie Brock watched him warily as he cast a quick spell on each of them. A beam of light shot out from his finger, enveloping their bodies before disappearing into their skin. The villains flinched and protested, demanding to know what Peter had done to them, but he only smirked and shrugged in response. Try to cause any trouble, and you'll find out, Peter warned, his voice laced with a menacing edge. Finally, Peter turned to Tom, a look of resignation on his face. Okay, you can let them out now. Tom nodded and approached the cells, unlocking them one by one, allowing the villains to step out into the undercroft. The tension in the room grew palpable as the former adversaries faced each other, the Spider-Man on guard, ready to intervene at the slightest hint of trouble. Venom eyed his former host from the confines of Flash's body, wondering if he should act now and return to Eddie or wait for a better opportunity. Or perhaps a better host. His eyes turned to scan the room, finding a few interesting candidates. Meanwhile, Doctor Strange remained confined in his cell, a scowl etched on his face. He muttered complaints and tried to explain why helping them was pointless. But Peter had heard enough. With a quick flick of his hand, Peter cast a spell on Strange cell, muting his words for the time being. Ignoring Strange completely, Tom turned his attention to the assembled group. All right, everyone. He addressed them firmly. 
We can't stay here, and we can't risk leaving them unsupervised. So, we need to find a safe place where we can regroup and figure out our next steps, May stepped up with an idea. We could use Happy's apartment. He's out of town and should still have some Stark tech that you guys can use. In the heart of an empty New York City junkyard, three figures seem to appear out of nowhere, each bewildered by their sudden displacement. Kingpin, a towering behemoth of a man, stepped forward, his imposing frame casting a long shadow over the decrepit machinery surrounding them. Dressed in a large black suit, which could be used to cover a car, his immense size and boxy appearance commanded attention. Dr. Olivia Octavius, a disheveled scientist with wild, untamed hair, stood beside him, her four mechanical tentacle-like arms flexing instinctively. And finally, Tombstone, a pale and sinister gangster-like figure, with his slicked-back white hair and finely tailored suit, completed the trio. A slash N. Obviously, they're from an Into a Spider-Verse universe. They know Spider-Man is Peter Parker so they fit the criteria for the spell, blinking in the dimly lit surroundings, Kingpin's deep voice boomed, where, where are we? Dr. Octavius adjusted her glasses and furrowed her brow, her eyes scanning the unfamiliar surroundings. Realization quickly dawned on her as she retrieved a small device from her lab coat. Activating it, she conducted a quick scan of the area, her gaze fixated on the readings. I, I can't believe it. This isn't our universe. Tombstone's gravelly voice cut through the tension, his eyes narrowing in Olivia's direction. Did your collider do this? He asked, accusingly. Kingpin clenched his fists, his massive form vibrating in anger. Shut it. We need to figure out where we are. Dr. Octavius turned to her boss, a hint of concern in her voice. We're out of our element here. This is so exciting. She happily exclaimed out of nowhere. Kingpin's intense gaze shifted from the junkyard to his loyal lackeys. Let's go find out if this universe has a Peter Parker and kill him. His grudge against the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man seemed to extend across the multiverse. The night was clear over New York City as a gust of wind swept across the towering skyscrapers. The Avengers Tower stood tall, its beacon of hope shining brightly in the darkness. Atop the building, the whirring of machinery and surveillance cameras hummed in the background, silently monitoring the city below. Unbeknownst to anyone, a strange phenomenon was about to unfold. Suddenly, with a blinding flash of light, a figure materialized on the rooftop, his lean frame exuding an air of confidence and charisma. Dressed in a broken iron suit of armor, which showed signs of an intense battle, he eyed the city below in confusion. Huh? How did I get here? He muttered in shock. He stumbled backwards, disoriented, his mind racing to comprehend what had just happened. Memories of snapping his fingers with a victorious smirk on his face flooded his mind, leading to his inevitable death. His body unable to survive the combined power of the Infinity Stones. I'm alive, he uttered, his mind racing at a million miles a minute. Suddenly, the alarms on the rooftop blared in response to his arrival, their shrill tones cutting through the night air. Startled, guards stationed in the tower quickly rushed to the source of the commotion. They arrived, guns drawn and expressions hardened, surrounding the bewildered man. A tense standoff ensued as the guards aimed their weapons at the unexpected intruder's back. Tony slowly turned around, his face partially hidden by the shadows. As he stepped into the dim light, his identity became clear, and the guard's jaws dropped in disbelief. It was Tony Stark, the man who had supposedly perished while saving the universe from Thanos, the Mad Titan. One guard, trembling slightly, managed to find his voice amidst the shock. It can't be. You're supposed to be dead. Tony smirked wryly, his eyes gleaming with a mixture of amusement and confusion. Yeah, well, death has a funny way of being overrated. Mind putting those things down? It's not exactly a warm welcome. After all, this is still my building, right? Reluctantly, the guards lowered their weapons, unable to tear their eyes away from the man who had become a legend. The news of Tony's sacrifice had spread far and wide, etching his memory into the hearts of countless people. Just then, a familiar figure clad in a formidable suit of armor emerged from behind the guards. It was James Rhodes, known to many as War Machine, a dear friend and ally of Tony's. His face was a mixture of astonishment and disbelief as he beheld the impossible sight before him. Tony? Rhodes stammered, his voice barely above a whisper. You you how? He couldn't find the words to say. Tony's gaze met Rhodes, his usual smirk replaced by a warm smile. You tell me, Rhodey. I've been asking myself the same question ever since I ended up here. One minute I'm gone, and the next. Well, I'm back, Tony explains, eyed his friend's upgraded armor. Looking good, by the way. I like what you've done with my design. Um, thanks. Rhodes just couldn't speak properly. 
Anyway, can we order some food? Tony asks as he pats his stomach. Being dead can really work up an appetite. I could eat a whole cow. A golden portal appeared, shimmering with energy as Peter and the group stepped out onto the hallway outside Happy's apartment. The villains, still in awe of the magic they had witnessed, gawked at their surroundings, their eyes darting in and out of the portal. Aunt May, being familiar with the place as Happy's ex-girlfriend, swiftly approached the door. She punched in a code on the keypad, her fingers moving with practiced ease. With a soft beep, the door unlocked, and she motioned for everyone to hurry inside before the neighbors could notice anything unusual. As they entered the apartment, the group found themselves in a cozy living room, adorned with various pieces of stark tech and personal belongings, including a framed picture of Happy and May, which she frowned at before laying it flat. Settling down on the couches and chairs, the villains eyed their surroundings with a mix of curiosity and suspicion. Peter took a seat, Lily perched herself on his lap, glancing around at the assembled Spider-Men and their allies. It was time to come up with a plan to help the villains, to find a way to cure them and set things right. Andrew, having dealt with Harry Osborne and Lizard in his own universe, spoke up first. I can handle Norman and Dr. Connors. I've already cured their problems once, so I know what to do. Toby nodded in agreement. I've got some ideas for Sandman and Doc Ock. I'll take care of them. Peter turned his attention to Electro, who seemed uncertain. Tom and I will work on Electro. We'll figure something out. Tom nodded, a determined look on his face. Absolutely. We'll analyze his powers and see if we can come up with a solution. Eddie Brock, who had been silent for a while, scoffed and scowled at the mention of being fixed. There's no fixing me, he stated firmly. Venom didn't change me. He just gave me the chance to stop hiding behind a facade. Toby, not one to give up easily, raised an eyebrow. I still think there might be a way, Eddie. Let's run some tests, okay? We'll see whether you're right or not. As everyone geared up to start their respective tasks, Tom suddenly rushed off to a nearby storage room. He returned with a large metal box with the Stark logo rolling behind him. With a press of a button, the box began to morph and transform, revealing itself to be the Stark Industries fabricator. The villain's eyes widened in awe as they watched the transformation. The fabricator was a state-of-the-art device capable of analyzing, designing, and constructing practically anything. It hummed with power, its sleek design showcasing its advanced capabilities. Electro's gaze lingered on the arc reactor, which powered the fabricator, feeling the immense energy emanating from it. A flash of greed flickered in his eyes before he quickly masked it, not wanting to reveal his true intentions. Tom gestured to the highly advanced 3D printer. This is the fabricator. It can help us expedite their cures. It can analyze and construct whatever we need. The group nodded, their determination renewed. They were excited at the opportunity to not just subdue the bad guys, but actually fix them. And so, in Happy's apartment, the Spider-Men and their allies began their work, utilizing their knowledge, skills, and the advanced technology at their disposal. Each focused on their assigned task, hoping to make a difference and set things right. But no one seemed to notice the small red blinking light on the fabricator, which sent out a message across the city toward the Avengers Tower. Avengers Tower Tony emerged from the bathroom, his hair still damp from the shower and dressed in a sleek, charcoal-colored suit. His face was freshly shaven, and his demeanor exuded the air of confidence that only Tony Stark possessed. Rhodes hovered nearby, unable to tear his eyes away from his miraculously returned friend. He would have followed his newly risen friend into the shower if he wasn't stopped. The shock of a hero returning from the dead was just as strong. You sure you're okay, Tony? Rhodes asked, his voice laced with concern. I mean, you just came back from the dead. It's, it's hard to wrap my head around. Tony chuckled lightly, running a hand through his damp hair. Yeah. Well, it's a mind-bender for me too. But here I am, good as new. He flashed a mischievous grin. Maybe not good in the conventional sense, but you get the idea. Rhodes' eyebrows furrowed as doubt clouded his features. Tony, I have to ask. How can I be sure you're really you? I mean, there are some pretty shady characters out there who would jump at the chance to impersonate you and infiltrate the Avengers. Tony's eyes gleamed with amusement as he sauntered away, motioning for Rhodes to follow him. He led the way to a seemingly ordinary dead-end hallway, a puzzled expression on Rhodes' face. What are we doing here? Rhodes questioned, his voice tinged with curiosity. Tony turned to face him, a glint of mischief in his eyes. Just watch. With a flourish, Tony pressed his hand against the wall at the end of the hallway. Rhodes watched, his eyes widening as the wall lit up, scanning Tony's handprint. Suddenly, a mechanical voice echoed through the hallway, verification, Tony Stark. Status, deceased. Error. Initiating vetting process, 
What followed after that was an in-depth 10-step verification process, which consisted of body part scans down to his skeleton and fluid analysis from simple things, like blood and saliva, to the more odd requests like urine. Tony made sure to smirk in his friend's direction as he drained his snake into a small hole in the wall, enjoying the look on Rhodey's face. And as the last of his urine was analyzed, the robotic voice returned. Vetting process complete. Welcome back, Mr. Stark. Rhodes glanced at Tony, his suspicion replaced by disgust. Did you have to add urine to the list? He asked, knowing Tony came up with the whole vetting process to begin with. Tony smirked as he zipped up his pants. Where's the fun in that? Besides, I had to be thorough. He motioned for Rhodes to step back, and the wall clanked a few times before slowly opening, revealing a hidden, dusty workshop bathed in soft lighting. Rhodes stood in awe, his eyes widening at the sight before him. The workshop was filled with all sorts of advanced technology and prototypes of unreleased Iron Man suits lined the walls. How? How did nobody know about this? Rhodes stammered, struggling to comprehend the hidden treasure trove in front of him. Tony chuckled, stepping into the workshop and motioning for Rhodes to follow. It's my secret getaway, Rhodey. The place where I stash all the fun stuff. Dangerous experiments and works in progress, mostly. Let's just say I'm not one to share all my toys with the world. Rhodes scanned the workshop, his eyes lingering on the suits with a mix of curiosity and awe. So, it's really you, huh? He turned to Tony in realization. Tony nodded, a gleam of satisfaction in his eyes. Yup, in the flesh. Rhodes let out a slow breath, his skepticism melting away. I guess you really are back, Tony. I can't believe it. Tony clapped Rhodes on the shoulder, a fond smile on his face. You should feel honored, you know? Nobody knew about this place. Rhodes looked around in awe, his gaze shifting from one technological marvel to another. How did you manage to keep this hidden? Tony shrugged, his eyes scanning the room as if searching for something. I guess I've always been good at hiding things. Besides, it's good to have a few surprises up your sleeve, right? As they spoke, a beeping sound suddenly emanated from Tony's workstation, drawing their attention. Rhodes raised an eyebrow, curiosity peak. What's that? Tony turned his gaze to the monitor that had lit up, his brows furrowing in confusion. A disembodied voice filled the room, its tone slightly perplexed. Sir, it appears that one of the Stark Industries fabricators has been activated. Which one? Tony asked as he glanced at the monitor. It replied, its voice tinged with concern. It seems the activity is originating from Happy Hogan's apartment. But Mr. Hogan is out of town. Tony's curiosity was piqued, and a video feed appeared on the screen, showing a hidden camera's perspective from inside the fabricator. The footage revealed four different Spider-Men and a group of shady-looking individuals working on something in Happy's living room. Tony's eyes narrowed as he tried to make sense of the situation. Rhodes glanced at the video, his confusion evident. I thought there was only one Spider-Man. Who are these other guys? Tony rubbed his chin deep in thought. I have no idea. He muttered, his eyes glued to the Peter, Tom. He knew, wondering why there was two of them? We need to find out what they're up to. Um, sure, but don't you want to see Pepper and Morgan? Rhodes asks, stopping Tony in his tracks. I'm sure they'll be happy to see you. Beyond happy actually. Before, Tony's mind was clouded with the fact that he was alive again, filled with all sorts of theories behind his return. But now, reality came crashing down like a ton of brick. He has a family that still thinks he's dead. What year is it? Tony asks, wondering how long he's been gone. It's 2024. Rhodes answers. Tony looked at the ground, a defeated sigh escaping his lips. So, I've been gone for a year? That's not too bad. Still, he couldn't help but regret missing a whole year of his daughter's life, not to mention his wife. Sensing his friend's turmoil, Rhodes stepped up and placed a comforting hand on Tony's shoulder. It's all right. You still have the rest of their lives to make up for lost time. It'll be hard, I'm sure, but you'll do fine. I know it. Tony scoffed haughtily. I'm Tony Stark. I'll do better than fine. He says, a confident smirk gracing his lips. But first, let's make sure Peter, Tom, doesn't mess anything up. Yeah, it might be too late for that. Toby, his brow furrowed in concentration, sat in front of a computer screen, analyzing data and organizing his thoughts. Eddie Brock sat across from him, a mixture of skepticism and annoyance written all over his face. Toby chose to work on three of the villains, Eddie Brock, Doc Ock, and Sandman. Doc Ock's cure was currently being crafted in the fabricator and Sandman was a complicated case, so he decided to run some tests on Eddie first. This moment was crucial, as he needed to understand the psychological state of his former co-worker and find a way to help him now that he's no longer being influenced by a symbiote. 
Toby glanced up at Eddie, his expression thoughtful. All right, we're going to run a series of physical and psychological tests to assess your mental state and identify any underlying issues that could be affecting you. It's important to understand that this is a process, meaning your cure may take longer than the rest. Over the years, Toby has read many psychology-related books. As a seasoned superhero, he understood that most people, villain or otherwise, don't just start off evil, nor do they usually think themselves evil, to begin with. Nobody wants to be evil. Everyone, besides sociopaths, psychopaths, etc., has a reason behind their actions, whether it be the way they were raised or an event that set them off course from the norm. Toby only hoped that Eddie didn't fall into the psychopath-slash-sociopath bracket since there's no real cure for something like that. Eddie nodded, a hint of apprehension evident in his eyes. He connected to Venom on a deep physical and mental level, which made their separation agonizing, like a druggie in withdrawal. He wasn't sure who he was without the symbiote's connection, feeling empty and powerless without its presence. After taking a bunch of samples from Eddie, like blood and other fluids, Toby placed a bunch of sensors on Eddie's head, each of them in key positions to examine his brain, similar to an MRI. With everything in place, Toby took a seat and reached for a stack of papers beside him, each one filled with questions and prompts. He handed a questionnaire to Eddie. I want you to answer these questions as honestly as possible. They'll give us a starting point to understand your mindset. Eddie took the questionnaire, scanning through the questions before starting to answer them aloud, obviously annoyed and snarky with his replies. Stopping at a specific question, Eddie looked up at Toby with a raised brow. How would I feel if my pet died? Seriously? He asks in exasperation. Toby replied, his eyes glued to the computer screen. Just answer the question. I'd toss him in a dumpster and move on. Who cares? Eddie replied callously, but his brain showed a very different response. Is that sadness? Toby questioned as a specific portion of Eddie's brain lit up. Maybe he isn't as incurable as he thinks he is. Back at the table, Eddie continued to answer the questions, his answers almost always sarcastic. Toby reviewed his notes from the completed questionnaire, his eyes scanning the pages. All right, Eddie, we're going to move on to a series of psychological tests to further understand your emotional state and cognitive processes. Eddie groaned in annoyance, his gaze fixed on Toby. What kind of tests are we talking about? Toby gestured to a nearby table where various objects were laid out. We'll start with a Rorschach inkblot test. I want you to look at these images and tell me what you see. Once Eddie was done being tortured by psychology, Toby carefully held a small computer chip in his hands. His eyes focused on the tentacles on Dr. Octavius' back. The others watched with anticipation, knowing that this moment could be the turning point in reclaiming the villain's humanity. The inhibitor chip in Toby's hand holds a single purpose, to stop the AI-driven tentacles on Doc Ock's back from controlling or influencing his mind, since they had to be connected to operate. When he first made the tentacles, he had a working inhibitor chip, allowing him to control them while staying sane. But sadly, that didn't last very long. An accident in the lab caused the chip to get fried, allowing the tentacles to influence him without his knowledge. But with a new, working chip, DR, Octavius should revert back to his original, kind nature that Toby remembers. After all, there was once a time when he looked up to Doc Ock, hoping to follow in his scientific footstep. All right, Doc, Toby called out, beckoning him forward. It's time to fix this. Dr. Octavius hesitated for a moment, his eyes flickering with uncertainty. He had been under the influence of his own creation for so long that the idea of regaining control seemed almost impossible. However, the calmness in Toby's voice and the determination in his eyes instilled a glimmer of hope within him. Slowly, Dr. Octavius approached, his tentacles twitching with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. Toby gently removed the malfunctioning inhibitor chip from the back of Dr. Octavius' neck, carefully disconnecting it from the interface. As he did so, the tentacles reacted, sensing a threat to their autonomy. They squirmed and flailed, aiming to knock Toby away. But their efforts were in vain. Peter's spell, still active within Dr. Octavius' body, surged with electricity, instantly incapacitating him and his unruly appendages. The room filled with crackling energy as Dr. Octavius convulsed and collapsed to the floor, his tentacles writhing in a futile struggle before going limp alongside him. Everyone watched, a mixture of awe and concern etched on their faces. The villains looked down at themselves, fearing the same would happen should they step out of line. Peter stepped forward, his voice calm but resolute. Toby, now's your chance. Replace the chip while they're down. Toby nodded, his hands steady as he inserted the newly fabricated neural inhibitor chip into the vacant slot on Dr. Octavius' neck. 
As the chip clicked into place, a wave of tranquility washed over the doctor's face. His furrowed brow smoothed, and the haunted expression that had plagued him for so long faded away. Dr. Octavius blinked, his eyes opening in astonishment. It was as if a weight had been lifted off his shoulders, and for the first time in a long while, his mind was clear and free from the incessant voices that had tormented him. Simultaneously, the tentacles on his back, once rebellious and uncontrollable, twitched and then stilled. No longer animated by their own will, they lay dormant, awaiting Dr. Octavius' command. Toby stepped back, a small smile playing on his lip. There you go, document. It's over now. Dr. Octavius slowly rose to his feet, his gaze focused on his newly subservient tentacles. He flexed each of them experimentally, a sense of wonder evident in his eyes. I, I can't believe it. They're under control. A relieved sigh escaped Toby's lips as he recognized the old Dr. Octavius's return. Welcome back, document. I've really missed you. I, it's good to be back. Once he was done with Doc Ock, who probably won't want to go by that name anymore, Toby turned his attention to Flint Marco, aka Sandman. Carefully studying some notes and research materials spread out before him, Toby had a few ideas. The molecular alteration caused by the Super Collider had granted Marco the ability to transform his body into sand, giving him control over every grain in his surroundings as well. It was a unique and challenging condition to tackle, but Toby was determined to find a cure. Sitting in the makeshift lab that was once Happy's living room, Toby meticulously went over the data, looking for any clues or patterns that could lead him in the right direction. He had access to advanced equipment and technology thanks to the Stark Industries fabricator, which greatly aided his research. As he analyzed the information, Toby's mind raced through various possibilities. He considered the nature of Marco's transformation, pondering the intricacies of sand manipulation and the molecular structure of his altered body. After some studying, Toby finally formulated a plan. He decided to focus on destabilizing the molecular structure of the sand particles that composed Marco's transformed body. If he could disrupt the cohesion between the sand particles, it might weaken Marco's control and eventually reverse the transformation. With a clear objective in mind, Toby set to work, gathering the necessary materials and preparing the equipment. Thankfully, he only had to request something and either the fabricator would make it, or Peter would portal it over in a matter of seconds. He carefully calibrated the devices, ensuring accuracy and precision in his experiment. Sandman stood nearby observing Toby's preparations with a mixture of curiosity and hope. He had long yearned to find a way to revert to his human form, to leave behind the life of a supervillain and just be a father. Toby approached Sandman, his gaze filled with empathy. I believe I may have a solution, he said, his voice calm and reassuring. But it's important to note that this is an experimental process. There are risks involved, and I can't guarantee any accidents won't happen. Are you okay with that? Sandman nodded, determination etched on his face. I'll do whatever it takes, just get it done. After witnessing DR, Octavius turned from a raving madman to the calm and collected man he sees before him, Marco wanted the same for himself and his family. No matter the cost, Toby's determination matched Marco's as he guided him to a specially designed chamber, which he only just finished crafting. The chamber was equipped with various devices and mechanisms intended to interact with Marco's sand form on a molecular level. Please step inside, Toby instructed, his voice steady and confident. Marco entered the chamber, a hopeful yet worried look on his face. Toby initiated the procedure with a tap on his keyboard, activating the mechanisms that would generate controlled disturbances within Marco's molecular structure. As the experiment commenced, Toby monitored the readings and feedback, making precise adjustments to the parameters. The chamber pulsed with energy as the devices worked in tandem, attempting to disrupt the cohesion between the sand particles. Marco's form wavered as patches of sand began to appear and disappear all over his body, his face displaying a mixture of discomfort and anticipation. He gritted his teeth, steeling himself against the potential side effects that may occur. Time seemed to stretch as Toby continued his work, his focus unyielding. Gradually, the sand particles within the chamber began to lose their fluidity, becoming more agitated and unstable. Suddenly, a surge of energy cascaded through the chamber, accompanied by a blinding flash. Toby's heart skipped a beat as he observed the reaction, hopeful that his efforts were yielding positive results. When the light subsided, Marco stepped out of the chamber, his form solidified in its human appearance. His expression held a mix of wonder and relief as he looked down at his hands, unable to call forth a single grain of sand. It worked, Marco whispered, his eyes growing watery. 
his voice filled with a mix of shock and gratitude. Stood at the back of the room, Norman's face began to twitch for a moment, unnoticed by the rest of the room. Suddenly, a dangerous look flashed over his eyes before disappearing, a kind facade returning. Once Toby was done hogging the fabricator, as they can't fabricate more than one thing at a time, Andrew could finally get to work on his group. All right, is it my turn now? Norman Osborne, or rather the Green Goblin, stepped forward alongside him, his posture composed and his expression a mask of congeniality. Unbeknownst to Andrew, the villainous alter ego had regained control, concealing his true intentions behind a facade of helpfulness. Norman extended a hand, his voice warm yet calculated. Andrew, my dear boy, I've been doing some thinking. I want to offer you my assistance in your endeavor to cure us. You may not know this, but I was quite the scientist back in my universe. Andrew raised an eyebrow, cautiously accepting Norman's handshake. You're really willing to help? Norman smiled, a hint of darkness hidden behind his gaze. Indeed, I'd like to know where I went wrong and be the one to truly cure myself. I understand the weight of my actions and the harm I've caused, even if I wasn't in control. If there's a chance for redemption, I wish to seize it. Andrew studied Norman, searching for any signs of deception. Something didn't feel right, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. Still, he couldn't pass up the opportunity to save lives, even if it meant working with someone he had fought against before. All right, Norman, if you're sincere, then we can work together, Andrew agreed cautiously. I have a plan in mind, a serum that should counteract the effects of the Green Goblin formula and get rid of that alter ego of yours for good. And for the lizard, a specialized gas that will neutralize his reptilian transformation, Norman nodded, a glimmer of anticipation in his eyes. Fascinating. Do explain the specifics. I'm all ears. Andrew took a deep breath, his mind focused on the task at hand. For the serum, I've devised a combination of genetic modifiers and cellular stabilizers. It will target the altered DNA caused by the Green Goblin formula and gradually restore it to its original state. The process will require a single injection. I have to warn you that it's a bit painful, but it won't last long, I promise. Norman's eyes narrowed slightly, a mixture of curiosity and wariness dancing in their depths. Ingenious. And what of the gas for the lizard? Dr. Connors joins the conversation. Yes, please explain, he asks, looming over the two of them. Andrew continued, his voice steady. The gas is a blend of specialized compounds that will act as a catalyst, triggering a biochemical reaction in the lizard DNA. It will counteract the transformation, reverting Dr. Connors to his human form. The gas will need to be inhaled, allowing it to directly interact with his respiratory system and distribute throughout his body. Norman leaned in, his interest growing. And the potential side effects? Will the serum and gas be safe? He asked as Lizard nodded along, unwilling to take it otherwise. Andrew contemplated his response, ensuring he provided a comprehensive answer. I've already been through this with Dr. Connors here. But you know, time travel, he states in annoyance. As for your cure, it's already been used on the Harry Osborne from my universe. Now, I know the Green Goblin serum that you've taken may be different, which is why we need to run some tests beforehand and make some tweaks, but there shouldn't be any problem. Norman's lips curled into a smile, his true nature beginning to seep through the cracks of his facade. Excellent. It seems we have much work ahead of us, Andrew nodded, a sense of cautious optimism filling his heart. He hoped that Norman's newfound cooperation was genuine, but he couldn't shake off the unease that lingered within him. Nonetheless, he would proceed with his plan. Let's get started then, Andrew said, a steely determination in his voice. We'll need to gather the necessary materials and prepare. Norman's smile widened, his eyes gleaming with malice hidden behind a thin veil of camaraderie. Indeed, my dear boy, let the cure begin. As they got to work, taking possession of the fabricator, Peter sat on the couch, a smile spreading across his face as he watched his daughter, Lily, engrossed in otherworldly television show. A slash N, like dimensional cable from Rick and Morty. He enjoyed times like this, where Lily's eyes widen in awe as she sees something brand new to her. It's one of the joys of parenting. He gets to relive things through the eyes of his daughter. Just as he settled into the peaceful atmosphere, Tom walked over, concern etched on his face. He glanced at Lily, ensuring their conversation wouldn't disturb her before speaking. Peter, we need to discuss our next steps with Electro's cure, Tom said, ready to get to work. Peter nodded, as his cure shouldn't be too hard. After all, he already knew what would work from the movie, though he has to make it real. He motioned for Tom to take a seat beside him. Grab me some paper and a pen, would you? Peter requested, his mind already racing with ideas. 
I need to sketch out the device we'll be creating. Tom nodded, quickly retrieving the requested materials. He handed them to Peter, who began to draw, his hand moving with a purposeful precision. As he sketched, he explained the concept to Tom. The key to extracting the excess energy from Electro's body lies in creating a device that can safely contain and redirect it. Peter began, his voice focused. We'll need a combination of specialized circuits, conductive materials, and an intricate network of capacitors. This device will act as a containment and energy extraction mechanism. Tom listened intently, following Peter's explanation. Weird, he thought, wondering how they had the same exact idea. Peter continued, his pen gliding across the paper. The device will consist of multiple layers, each serving a specific purpose. The outer layer will be composed of a high-density polymer that can withstand the immense energy levels without deteriorating. Beneath that, we'll have a network of conductive filaments, strategically placed to absorb and distribute the energy. Finally, the core will house an array of capacitors, designed to store and regulate the excess energy. As Peter finished his sketch, he looked up, meeting Tom's gaze. Once the device is in place, we'll need to synchronize it with Electro's own energy patterns. This will allow us to control the extraction process and minimize any potential harm. After all, we need to leave behind a small bit of energy, or else he'll die. Their conversation had drawn the attention of Electro, who had been lingering nearby, his frustration palpable. He grumbled under his breath, resenting the notion of being cured but trapped by the spell that Peter placed on him. For a single moment, he wondered whether the spell placed on him would be the same as Dr. Octavius. Because if it was, he would only receive a power boost from the electricity, though he doubted whether Peter would be so stupid. Peter noticed Electro's reaction but remained undeterred. He folded the sketch and handed it to Tom, a determined glint in his eyes. We have a plan, Tom. With this device, we'll be able to safely extract the excess energy from Electro. Easy, right? Tom nodded, taking the sketch and studying it carefully. Yeah, I think so. He says as he glances at the fabricator, which was already in use. But, I guess we have to wait. It's fine. Peter shrugged uncaringly as he motioned toward the TV. Can you explain this show to us? Huh. Tom turns to see a man in an arena, facing off against a car. It's called Man vs. Car. I don't get it either. Your universe is weird. Lily comments as she flips through the channel, finding a commercial about something called Strawberry Smiggles. Norman worked diligently alongside Andrew, keeping his intentions and plans hidden away from prying eyes. He had deceived everyone, disguising his true intentions behind a veil of helpfulness and redemption. While the others believed he was working on their cures, he was secretly altering the formulas, infusing them with a malevolent twist that only he knew. With a sinister grin curling his lips, Norman tinkered with the vials, carefully adjusting the ingredients. He reveled in the thought of the chaos and destruction that would soon unfold, relishing the power that surged within him. As he mixed the concoctions, a mad glimmer danced in his eyes. Soon enough, it came time to administer the cures, and Norman orchestrated the final act of his treacherous plan. Watching as Andrew gathered the vials, he joined Dr. Connors, who had unknowingly become entangled in Norman's web of deceit. The moment has arrived, Norman said, his voice dripping with feigned concern. I'm a bit nervous, but I know this is for the best. Dr. Connors nodded, unaware of the sinister intentions hidden behind Norman's gentle facade. The prospect of reverting back to his human form filled him with a small bit of hope. Are you ready? Andrew asks as he loads both vials into their respective devices. A giant syringe for Norman and a breathing mask for Lizard. Nodding, they prepared themselves, Norman's heart raced with anticipation. Taking the syringe from Andrew, he injected himself with a swift motion, a malicious smile spreading across his face, unable to hold himself back any longer. A surge of energy rushed through Norman's veins, accompanied by an agonizing pain. His body convulsed, muscles bulging and contorting as he transformed. His skin turned a sickly shade of green, and protruding bones formed a grotesque exoskeleton, resembling his monstrous alter ego, the Green Goblin. Simultaneously, Dr. Connors breathed in his own cure, unaware of the consequences, hoping for a cure but unknowingly sealing his fate. In an instant, the room filled with anguished screams as Dr. Connor's body grew, his bones elongating and reshaping. His transformation intensified, his mind succumbing to a primal, animalistic state. The group stood frozen, their eyes widening in horror as they witnessed the catastrophic results of Norman's betrayal. Lily turned away from the TV, watching the two monsters alongside her father, who was genuinely surprised by this turn of events. Huh, that didn't happen in the movie. 
Nonetheless, Peter remained calm and watched their transformation in interest. Norman's laughter echoed through the room, a wicked symphony of triumph and malice. Ha! Ah, this power, it's so intoxicating. As the dust settled, the monstrous forms of Norman, now a hulking green goblin, and the mutated Dr. Connors, known as the Lizard, loomed over the room. The air was thick with tension as Andrew and everyone else realized the depths of Norman's treachery. As this was happening, Flash Thompson stood across the room, Venom lurking underneath his skin, observing the chaos and sensing an opportunity. As Venom watched Norman's transformation into a true green goblin, a hunger ignited within the symbiote. The sight of the powerful and monstrous creature stirred its primal instincts. It saw in Norman the perfect host, one with immense power and darkness, a combination that enticed Venom's insatiable cravings. Without hesitation, Venom seized the moment, sensing a, a momentary vulnerability in Norman's transformation. The black, liquid-like form of the symbiote erupted from Flash's body, tearing through his clothing and revealing its horrifying presence. Its long tendrils snaked their way across the room and up Norman's legs, clinging to his body with an unnatural grip. Norman's eyes widened in shock as the alien entity covered him, its tendrils seeping into his skin. The symbiote's dark essence melded with Norman's transformed state, merging into a terrifying union. Venom had found its new host, one whose darkness matched its own. For a moment, Norman's brows furrowed as a silent conversation took place between the two entities before both sides seemed to come to an agreement. A deep, resonating voice echoed from the merged form of Venom and Norman, their words filled with a mix of malice and triumph. Together, we are reborn. The room trembled with the weight of their malevolence, as the newly formed Venom Goblin turned its attention toward the stunned heroes. A sinister grin stretched across its monstrous face, razor-sharp teeth gleaming with wicked glee. Beside him, the hulking lizards let out a monstrous roar, shaking the building with its voice alone. Downstairs, a car pulled up to the front of the building and two figures stepped out. You're telling me Peter, Tom, was tricked by that loser Quinton Beck? Tony asked, recalling the guy that used to work at his company. You know I slept with his wife, right? He blurts out, getting an accusing look from Rhodey. What? This was before Pepper. I can't believe you. Rhodes shakes his head in exasperation, realizing that Tony's cuckolding of Mysterio was most likely a big reason why he became a villain. Roar. Suddenly, a deafening roar, similar to a T-Rex echoed in their direction. Flash Thompson, his body finally freed from the clutches of Venom, stumbled backward in shock. He was both relieved and terrified, the adrenaline coursing through his veins as he processed the sudden return of control over his own body. His heart pounded in his chest, and he could hardly believe the ordeal he had just endured. Aunt May, who had been watching the chaos unfold, rushed over to Flash, noticing him start to hyperventilate. Hey, it's going to be okay. Take deep breaths, all right? You're safe? Flash nodded, his breathing slowly returning to normal. He looked up at May, gratitude and fear mingling in his eyes. I, I can't believe it. That, that thing, it took over me. I couldn't do anything. May nodded empathetically, understanding the traumatic experience Flash had gone through. It's okay, you're going to be alright, as May comforted Flash, the rest of the group remained focused on the two formidable figures that had emerged from Norman's betrayal. The new Venom-Goblin partnership towered over the room, its monstrous appearance and wicked grin instilling a sense of dread among the heroes. Meanwhile, the hulking lizard let out another earth-shaking roar, its primal instincts fully taking hold. The room trembled under the weight of its presence, and the heroes understood the imminent danger they faced. Before any confrontation could erupt, a voice called out from the shadows, slicing through the tense atmosphere. Hey, Venom, it's me. Come on, over here. Eddie Brock, who had once been Venom's host, stepped forward, desperation etched on his face. He held on to a glimmer of hope that Venom would abandon its new host and return to him. But his hopeful anticipation quickly turned to shock and sadness as Hobgoblin, Venom Goblin's new nickname, let out a booming laughter. You weak, pathetic fool, Venom spoke, a chilling mixed callousness to his tone. I've got the perfect host right here. What do I need you for? You're not worthy. Eddie's face fell, disbelief and heartbreak painted across his features. His former companion had cast him aside, deeming him unworthy. The rejection stung, fueling a surge of anger within him. In a fit of rage, Eddie lunged at Hobgoblin, throwing punch after punch, his fists connecting with the monstrous creature's hardened form. But Hobgoblin stood tall, absorbing the blows without flinching, as if being assaulted by a weak and pitiful toddler. The creature's laughter filled the room, a twisted symphony of malevolence. Is that all you've got, Eddie? 
You're nothing compared to the power I possess now. In fact, you've always been nothing. Just another weak meat bag. Hobgoblin raised its arm, ready to rip Eddie to shreds, relishing in the opportunity to demonstrate its dominance. But just as it prepared to strike, Peter's spell, the insurance he had placed on each of the villains, activated. Golden ropes shot out from Hobgoblin's body, wrapping around it tightly, restraining its movements. The creature let out a roar of frustration and struggled against the bindings, its power rendered ineffective. Eddie, saved from the imminent threat, collapsed on the floor, his body trembling with fear. He scrambled away from the bound Hobgoblin, his eyes wide with a mix of terror and disbelief. He had narrowly escaped death and realized that without Venom, he was nothing but a powerless human. The new lizard, his mind still clouded by primal instincts, witnessed the chaos unfolding with Hobgoblin's restraints. Instinctively, he sought an escape route and fixated on the nearest window. With a powerful leap, he launched himself toward the opening, shattering the glass in his path. As Lizard plummeted towards the ground, Peter's spell triggered, enveloping his massive reptilian body in a golden glow. Gravity intensified around him, accelerating his fall and making it increasingly difficult for him to move. After a short fall, he smashed into the hard ground, creating a large crater that shook the earth below. Ray Awa! He roared and struggled against the gravity, desperately trying to regain control, but the weight of the spell kept him pinned belly down on the unforgiving concrete. Meanwhile, Tony and Rhodey, having just arrived, watched in confusion and shock as giant dinosaur-looking lizard flew out of a window and crashed into the ground, the impact sending tremors through the earth. They exchanged a bewildered glance, struggling to comprehend the bizarre circumstances unfolding before them. Is that a T-Rex? What kind of weird shit has been going on since I left? Tony asks as his red and gold Iron Man suit covers his body. Rhodes was just as confused as him. How the hell am I supposed to know? He shrugs as his own suit appears, a giant turret forming over his shoulder. Back upstairs, Hobgoblin continued to thrash and struggle against his restraints. With the combined might of Venom and Green Goblin, as well as the serum that transformed Norman's body, they exerted their newfound power, gradually breaking free, one golden rope at a time. Ha ha ha! Their malicious laughter echoed through the room as they inched closer to freedom. Ha! Huh. Peter grunted with an impressed look on his face. You know, although that spell isn't very strong, the fact that you can break it is pretty impressive. Snapping in annoyance, MJ turned to Peter, shocked that he was so calm right now. Can you save the compliments for later? This is a serious situation. Lily, who sat beside her father, turned to her mother's counterpart. My dad is the strongest. These losers may be strong for you guys, but for him, these are just low-level mobs. She states proudly, using her newly acquired video game knowledge from her Uncle Ned. As they spoke, Electro remained relatively still, fearing the activation of Peter's spell. But when he witnessed Hobgoblin breaking free from his spell, he decided to try his luck as well. With a malevolent grin, he surrounded himself in a deadly aura of electricity, crackling and arcing with lethal power. In a swift motion, he made a mad dash toward the fabricator, aiming to seize the valuable arc reactor. Just as Electro's fingers closed around the coveted device, his own spell activated, encasing him within a translucent sphere of golden light. He found himself trapped, unable to escape the confines of the magical barrier. Yet, undeterred, a maniacal determination shone in his eyes. With the arc reactor in his possession, Electro drew upon its infinite power, tapping into its vast energy. Empowered by the surge of electricity, he unleashed a powerful surge, breaking free from the confines of the spell that held him captive. As the last golden barrier shattered, he stood triumphant, his body pulsating with raw energy. But he didn't stand alone. No, just as Electro broke the barrier, Hobgoblin snapped the last rope, freeing himself completely. Ha ha, I'm free, and I'll take pleasure gutting each and every one of you. He turns and eyes each Spider-Man before stopping at Toby. Especially you. As the tension in the room reached its peak, the Spider-Men, united in their determination, positioned themselves in front of the weaker individuals, forming a protective barrier. Andrew, Tom, and Toby stood side by side, ready to face the oncoming threat. Doc Ock stood beside Toby, his metallic arms poised for action. Allow me to assist, for old time's sake. He offered, bringing a smile to Toby's face. Hobgoblin's laughter echoed through the room, his monstrous form and newfound power fueling his arrogance. Ah, you think you can stand against us? We are unstoppable. Prepare to be crushed, little spiders. Electro, intoxicated by the surge of power from the arc reactor, smirked and crackled with electricity. 
I've got enough power to fry this entire city. Killing all of you will be nothing. Just as the tension threatened to erupt into a full-blown battle, Peter, calm and composed, stood up from the couch. Stretching his arms casually, he drew everyone's attention, his gaze fixated on Electro and Hobgoblin. All right, guys, since my spells failed, I'll take care of these two, Peter announced, his voice steady. He wore a smirk on his face, a relaxed confidence surrounding him. The villain's laughter continued as they exchanged glances. They didn't believe Peter could be so calm and self-assured in the face of their combined power, thinking he was merely pretending. Hobgoblin scoffed, his voice dripping with mockery. Oh, look at the brave little spider. Think you can take us on, do you? You're out of your league. Peter's smirk widened, his eyes sparkling with mischief. In a burst of incredible speed, he disappeared from his spot and reappeared beside Hobgoblin, his hand poised in a seemingly harmless gesture. Without a moment's hesitation, Peter flicked a single finger against Hobgoblin's forehead, a quick and seemingly innocent action. But the impact came with a surprising, thunderous shockwave, launching the mad villain backward and crashing through the nearest window. The room fell into stunned silence as everyone turned their attention to the shattered glass and the fading echoes of Hobgoblin's agonized scream. Even Electro's laughter came to an abrupt halt, his expression one of disbelief. Peter turned to Electro and held up a glowing object in his hand, showing off a shining arc reactor. You know it's rude to steal, especially from people who were trying to help you. Electro's eyes go wide as he looks down at his hand, realizing that the reactor that once fueled him was gone. The earth trembled once again as Hobgoblin tumbled out of the window, crash landing beside the struggling lizard with a bone-rattling thud. His forehead caked in blood from his earlier encounter with Peter, but his rage burned hot, fueling his desire for vengeance. Tony and Rhodes, still reeling from the chaos that had unfolded, watched in astonishment as the hulking villain rose to his feet, his eyes filled with malice and fury. They exchanged a brief glance, silently communicating their plan in a matter of moments. Of, uh, hey there, big guy. Rhodes calls out, hoping to resolve things peacefully. You okay? Hobgoblin's deep growl reverberated through the night as he locked eyes with the two armored heroes. With a feral snarl, he lunged forward, his massive claws slicing through the air, leaving deep gouges in the floor and walls as he moved. I don't think it wants to talk. Tony muttered as the black and green beast grew closer and closer. Tony, encased in his red and gold Iron Man suit, swiftly activated his repulsors, jets of energy propelling him into the air, evading Hobgoblin's initial attack. Rhodey, clad in his own suit, the war machine, braced himself, his heavy armor absorbing the impact as Hobgoblin's pitch-black claws scraped across his metallic form. With a roar of frustration, Hobgoblin turned his attention to Rhodey, his monstrous strength on full display. He unleashed a flurry of strikes, each blow delivered with bone-crushing force. Rhodey fought back, his own armored fists meeting Hobgoblin's onslaught with unwavering determination. A clash of metal reverberated through the air as the two titans exchanged blow after blow. Rhodey's suit, designed for warfare, held up against Hobgoblin's brute strength, absorbing the impact of each strike. But Hobgoblin was relentless, his rage lending him an unnerving tenacity. Back upstairs, Peter's eyes glinted dangerously as he turned his attention to Electro. The room remained silent, the villain's laughter silenced by Peter's swift and surprising display of power. With a flicker of movement, Peter dashed towards Electro, closing the distance between them faster than lightning. Electro's eyes widened in realization, his overconfidence waning as he realized his mistake. But it was too late to react as Peter's fist connected with Electro's electrified form, sending him hurtling out of the already broken window. The force of the impact echoed through the building as glass shattered, and a cloud of dust billowed into the room. Ugh! Electro grunted in pain as he was launched out of the building, his screams fading into the distance. Without hesitation, Peter followed suit, stepped out of the window in pursuit of Electro. Humph! Lily held her head high and smirked in MJ's direction. See? I told you my dad is the strongest. MJ didn't have any words to say and simply nodded her head dumbly. Although none of them doubted Peter's abilities, they also didn't expect him to send Hobgoblin flying with a single flick of his finger. Tony circled above, his eyes scanning for an opening. He analyzed Hobgoblin's movements, searching for a weakness to exploit. With pinpoint accuracy, he fired a barrage of repulsor blasts, aiming to distract the monstrous villain. Hobgoblin, momentarily caught off guard, roared in fury as the blast struck him, causing his momentum to falter. Tony seized the opportunity, descending swiftly, his gauntlet-clad fist connecting with Hobgoblin's jaw, sending him staggering backward. 
but the resilient villain quickly regained his composure. With a mighty swipe of his clawed hand, he sent Tony hurtling through the air, crashing into a wall. The impact rattled Tony. His vision momentarily blurred, but he fought through the pain, pushing himself back into the fray. Rhodey, seeing Tony in trouble, unleashed a barrage of heavy firepower from his shoulder-mounted turret. The concussive blasts and energy projectiles rained down upon Hobgoblin, causing the ground to shake with the force of the onslaught. The villain staggered, his monstrous form barely able to withstand the relentless assault. Taking advantage of the distraction, Tony activated his suit's thrusters, propelling himself back into the fight. He targeted Hobgoblin's exposed back, firing a concentrated beam of energy that sliced through the air. The searing blast struck Hobgoblin with unyielding force, leaving a smoking hole in his armored hide. Hobgoblin bellowed in agony, his rage intensifying. He turned toward Tony, his eyes burning with a vengeful fire. With renewed ferocity, he charged at the armored Avenger, his massive form barreling through the debris-strewn battlefield. But before he could get too close, a blue flash suddenly descended from above, bashing into his back. The impact of it created yet another crater in the apartment building's parking lot. When the dust settled, Hobgoblin realized who it was that suddenly attacked him. Cough. Cough. Electro coughed as he picked himself up, bleeding from the mouth and nose. What the hell are you doing, you idiot? Hobgoblin raged as its attention turned from the two tin cans to his fellow conspirator. We have to run. Cough he's coming dash, Electro tried to explain but it was already too late. Performing a textbook 10 out of 10 superhero landing, Peter touched down between the two villains. Behind him, Lizard continued his futile struggle against the power of gravity, thrashing and roaring up a storm. With a smirk, Peter taunted the villains. You two really thought you could escape? Well, I'm about to show you just how wrong you are. He said as he noticed Iron Man and War Machine standing a few meters away. Is that Tony or is someone just using his armor? Hobgoblin snarled, his voice laced with rage. You'll regret underestimating us. Without wasting another moment, Hobgoblin lunged at Peter, his claws extended and ready to tear through flesh. But Peter, anticipating the attack, effortlessly sidestepped, allowing Hobgoblin's momentum to carry past him. With lightning-fast reflexes, Peter seized Hobgoblin's arm midair, twisted it with precision, and sent the villain crashing into the ground. Hobgoblin grunted in pain, his body embedded in the concrete floor. With a deep growl, he struggled to break free, but Peter's strength proved overwhelming. Using his enhanced agility, Peter leaped into the air, flipping and stomped on Hobgoblin's back with a powerful kick, sending him deeper into the parking lot floor. Meanwhile, Electro gathered his energy, his body crackling with electricity. He released a torrent of lightning bolts towards Peter, hoping to catch him off guard. But Peter, ever alert, dodged the projectiles with a series of acrobatic moves, evading the deadly bolts with ease. Closing the distance between them, Peter launched himself forward, his fists moving in a blur that even Electro couldn't follow. With each strike, his blows connected with precision, sending sparks flying as he pummeled the electric villain. The sheer force behind each punch and kick staggered Electro, causing him to stumble backward further and further. But Electro wasn't one to give up. Channeling his electricity, he unleashed a devastating surge of power, enveloping himself in a deadly aura. Bolts of lightning crackled around him, dancing in a lethal display. Peter, undeterred by the electrifying display, activated his own powers in the mystic arts. His body shimmered with a golden glow, nullifying every bit of electricity that came his way. With a sudden burst of speed, Peter closed the gap between them, still absorbing the electrified storm. Weak. He commented as he delivered a swift punch to Electro's stomach. The force behind the blow was enough to send blood shooting out of Electro's mouth as he shot backwards, smacking into the side of a car, which toppled over upon impact. But Electro, desperate to regain the upper hand, unleashed yet another devastating wave of electricity. Bolts of lightning surged toward Peter, threatening to overwhelm him. Uncaringly, Peter strolled forward, absorbing the lethal barrage like it was nothing. Once again, Peter seized the opportunity, launching himself at Electro. He spun through the air, his leg extended, connecting with a powerful roundhouse kick. The impact sent Electro flying across the parking lot, crashing into debris and leaving a trail of destruction in his wake. As Electro struggled to recover, Hobgoblin finally broke free from his concrete prison, fueled by a mix of fury and determination. He charged at Peter, his monstrous form tearing through the room, leaving destruction in his wake. But Peter remained calm, his senses honed, ready to whoop some ass. With agile and simple movements, Peter evaded Hobgoblin's frenzied attacks, 
effortlessly sidestepping each swing. Is that all you can do? This is pretty lame. Don't you have anything else? Have you always been this weak? He taunted, enjoying himself as his opponent wears himself out. After sending Hobgoblin into a blind rage, Peter finally launched a counterattack. He leaped into the air, his body twisting as he stomped his foot down on his opponent's forehead. His boot collided with Hobgoblin's skull, delivered with incredible force. The impact sent a shockwave throughout the area and sent the recipient crashing to the cement floor. With a final burst of energy, Peter channeled his powers, his muscles rippling with raw strength. He lunged at Hobgoblin, delivering a series of rapid-fire blows, each strike landing with precision. The force behind his punches and kicks was enough to send shockwaves through the area, shattering nearby windows and crumbling the pavement below. Hobgoblin's eyes became hazy, his strength waning. The combination of Peter's relentless assault and his own exhaustion proved too much to bear. With one final strike, Peter delivered a powerful fist, which shook Hobgoblin's brain. The villain's eyes fluttered shut, his brain shutting down into a deep sleep. God damn, Tony muttered as he turned to Rhodes. When did Peter, Tom, get this strong? He asked, not aware that this wasn't the Peter he knew. Rhodes shook his head side to side. Um, I don't know. As Hobgoblin lay defeated, Electro slowly rose from the debris, his once menacing aura diminished. The sparks of electricity that crackled around him flickered weakly. He glanced at Peter, a mix of fear and disbelief in his eyes. Peter approached Electro, his movements deliberate and controlled, holding up the stolen arc reactor. You think you could handle this power, but you're wrong. You're nothing but an energy junkie, a frail little boy who was bullied all of his life. And you know what? I can relate. But when you finally became strong enough to stand up for yourself, you forgot that you could stand up for others as well. Instead of helping those that needed it, you turned into another bully. Every word that Peter spoke struck Electro like a barrage of flaming arrows, each landing with pinpoint accuracy. And before you say some lame shit like you don't know me, do both of us a favor and keep quiet, Peter said as he drew closer and closer. You know, I try to be nice for the most part, but I'm just going to say it. You make me sick. With a flex of his hand, Peter crushed the arc reactor, causing the electricity within it to fade. The last remaining villain slumped to the ground, his eyes dull and dead, his defeat delivered with words alone. The whole scene fell into silence once more, the aftermath of the battle hanging heavy in the air. Peter stood tall, his eyes scanning the area where he saw Tony and Rhodes. But before he could say anything to them, everyone else arrived, including Lily, who jumped on Peter's back, excited for her father's victory. That was so cool, she exclaimed as everyone else seemed to notice the two Iron Men. Tom frowned deeply as he noticed Tony's suit. Hey, take that off. It doesn't belong to you. He exclaimed, unwilling to let anyone don his mentor's armor. Suddenly, the mechanical mask lifted open, revealing Tony's smirking face. Hey there, kid. I'm back. As everyone marveled at the sight of Tony Stark, alive and well, the shock and disbelief rippled through the group. Tom, in particular, was overcome with a mixture of emotions. Tears welled up in his eyes as he stared at the man he thought he had lost forever. A father figure that left far too soon. He stepped forward, his voice trembling with a mix of relief and disbelief. Tony. I thought you were gone. I saw. I saw you die. Tom choked out, his voice laced with raw emotion. Tony smiled warmly, a hint of sadness in his eyes. Hey kid, I know it's hard to believe, but somehow, here I am. One minute I'm staring down Thanos, and the next I'm on top of the Avengers Tower, surrounded by security, you should have seen the looks on their faces when they realized it was me. He chuckled in amusement. Tom couldn't hold back his emotions any longer. He rushed forward and embraced Tony, tears streaming down his face. Tony awkwardly returned the hug, patting Tom on the back. It's okay. I'm here now, Tony whispered, his voice filled with reassurance. He couldn't help but turn to Peter, wondering why his little protege had a taller, an admittedly stronger clone. Not to mention the two other Spider-Men, who stood alongside May and everyone else. The rest of the group watched the heartwarming reunion with a mixture of joy and relief. MJ, May, and Ned shared smiles, confused but glad to see Tony alive and well. It was a moment of respite amidst the chaos they had been facing lately. While the reunion unfolded, Peter turned his attention to the captured villains. He approached the restrained lizard, who was still struggling under the weight of the gravity spell. Peter extended his hand, channeling his magic once again, and gently lifted the spell's effect from the giant reptilian creature. Hey, big guy, time to calm down, Peter said softly, hoping to coax the beast into a more docile state. Lizard's yellow eyes glared at Peter, 
filled with anger and hate. He growled and roared, but Peter remained unfazed. With a quick tap to the forehead, Peter cast a sleep spell, knowing Dr. Connors wasn't very lucid at the moment. Within seconds, the giant lizard was lulled into a deep slumber. Taking advantage of the moment, Peter summoned golden chains made of eldritch energy and swiftly wrapped them around the sleeping lizard, restraining his massive form. Moving on, Peter approached Electro, who remained on his knees, staring into the distance with a defeated expression, a dead look in his eyes. After hearing Peter's harsh words, he began to realize every mistake he's made since falling into that tank of electric eels. I could have been a hero? His mind repeated over and over. The electric villain didn't resist as Peter formed golden shackles out of eldritch energy and bound him tightly. With precise control, Peter levitated Electro and placed him beside the slumbering lizard. Finally, Peter turned his attention to Hobgoblin, lying unconscious and battered on the ground. After a moment of contemplation, Peter began to draw intricate golden spell circles in the air above the villain's body. The rest of the group, including Tony and Rhodey, watched with curiosity and anticipation, unfamiliar with Peter's magical abilities. What's he doing? Tony asked curiously. Nobody else had a clue either. As the spell circles activated, a shimmering energy seeped into Hobgoblin's skin. Slowly, black sludge started to ooze from every pore of his body, expelled by the energy. The sludge pooled on the ground, gradually taking shape and revealing two distinct forms. Green Goblin and Venom. The separate entities lay dormant, their unconscious forms still fast asleep after their brutal beating. Peter completed the spell, ensuring that both Green Goblin and Venom remained restrained, unable to cause further harm. With the villains securely contained and their powers neutralized, Peter prepared for his next bit of magic. This should work. Peter stepped over to the restrained form of Venom, his hands moving in precise, intricate motions as he drew new spell circles in the air. The golden energy crackled and hummed, infused with eldritch energy. The rest of the group watched in anticipation, their expressions a mix of concern and curiosity. What is he doing now? MJ asked, her voice laced with worry. I'm not sure, May replied, her eyes fixed on Peter's concentrated form. But he must have a plan. Peter's eyes glinted with determination as he started an incantation, his voice low and commanding as he spoke fluent Mandarin. Yumo Gui Gui Fai Dizeo, Yumo Gui Gui Fai Dizeo, Yumo Gui Gui Fai Dizeo, the golden spell circles hovered above Venom, pulsating with power. As the final words left Peter's lips, the energy surged, enveloping the restrained symbiote. Venom's eyes snapped open, the pure black orbs shimmering with malevolence and rage. With a snarl, he thrashed against his restraints, desperately trying to break free. The spell circles held him fast, restraining his violent movements. Peter, what are you doing? Toby's voice rang out, filled with concern. I'm giving Venom another chance, Peter responded, his voice steady despite the chaos unfolding before him. But in order to do that, I need to wipe his mind. It's been tainted by Eddie and the Goblin's craziness. And now that I'm taking a look, we can even throw some blame on you as well. Huh? Toby grunted in surprise. What did I do? Venom's struggles intensified as he heard Peter's words, a guttural growl escaping his throat. The symbiote strained against the spell circles, the black goo pulsating with a mixture of fear and anger. But Peter's magic held firm, preventing Venom from breaking free. Well, let's take a look at his memories, shall we? Peter says as he intercepts some of Venom's memories before deletion and waves his hand up to the sky. In an instant, holographic images filled the night sky, showing Venom's ship crash landing on Earth. Toby's Earth to be exact. A slash N. Just to be clear, I'm changing Venom's origin a bit to suit my needs. Also, the Peter and Spider-Man in this flashback slash memory viewing is Toby. The night was draped in darkness as Venom's ship streaked through the sky, hurtling towards Earth. The alien creature within the ship was hungry, its insatiable appetite gnawing at its consciousness. It longed for the taste of meat, ignorant of the concepts of right and wrong. Venom was an entity born of survival, devoid of any moral compass, and without anyone to guide it. As the ship descended towards the Earth's surface, it crashed into an empty park, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. The impact shattered the night's silence, the ground trembling beneath the weight of the crash. Smoke billowed into the air, obscuring the area as Venom emerged from the wreckage, his black tendrils slithering out, seeking sustenance. After slithering out of the park in search of food, Venom's eyes locked onto an elderly woman walking alone on the dimly lit city street. She didn't smell very tasty, but he would have to make do. He prepared to strike, hunger fueling his intentions, but it seemed like fate had other plans. Just as Venom prepared to pounce, 
a blur of red and blue streaked overhead. Spider-Man had arrived, his spider sense alerting him to potential danger. With acrobatic finesse, he swiftly dispatched a group of robbers who were about to surround the woman, their ill intentions shattered like glass. Stay safe, ma'am. Spider-Man gave her a salute before rushing off. As Venom watched the hero in action, a realization dawned upon him. Spider-Man was strong, taking out a group of meat bags with ease. He became fixated on the idea that Spider-Man could be the perfect host. In the following hours, Venom silently stalked his chosen prey, still hungry after missing out on his meal. Under the cover of night, he trailed Spider-Man back to his apartment, his black mass coiling and merging with the shadows. With calculated precision, Venom waited until Peter Parker succumbed to sleep, his guard down. As the room fell into a deep silence, the symbiote emerged from the darkness, its inky form crawling across the walls and ceiling. It crept towards Peter, sensing his troubled soul, his heart weighed down by the burden of his personal struggles. In a horrifying dance, Venom extended its tendrils, delicately enveloping Peter, bonding with him on a molecular level. The symbiotic fusion was complete, and the two began to slowly influence one another. Days and weeks passed after Peter found out about Venom. Through the blossoming symbiotic relationship, Venom's emotions and feelings became Peter's, and Peter's emotions and feelings became Venom's. Though Peter didn't seem to realize this, thinking Venom was affecting him alone, he slowly began to hate his gooey companion, and this lack of knowledge and hate seemed to slowly turn Venom from a naive alien, who admittedly had a craving for human brains, into the villain that he became today. It especially didn't help that his time with Peter was rather dark. Peter's life was in shambles. The love of his life was going to marry the son of the man who hated him most. His best friend hated him for killing his father, and his Aunt May was in and out of the hospital due to cancer treatments, nearly dying in the process. These dark emotions were all shared with Venom, molding him into the alien blob he is today. When the holograms disappeared, everyone turned to Toby, who frowned deeply and looked down at the floor, realizing that he could have done better. But don't beat yourself up too much, Peter said as he deleted those memories. You didn't know how symbiotes worked and already had a lot on your plate. Sure, you could have done better, but that's life. We could always do better. Hindsight is 20 20th. Painful screams filled the air, drawing everyone's attention, as Peter's spell continued its work. Venom's form convulsed, writhing in agony as his memories were slowly erased. Each scream pierced the night air, a haunting symphony of suffering. The group watched in horror, their hearts aching for the tortured creature. Peter, this, this seems cruel, May murmured, her voice trembling with unease. Peter's gaze never wavered, his focus solely on completing the spell. It may seem that way, but Venom's mind has been corrupted by the influence of others. If he's to have a chance at redemption, I have to wipe away the pain and darkness that taints his memories. As the minutes stretched on, Venom's screams grew more desperate and anguished. The agony etched on his twisted, gooey form was undeniable. But Peter remained resolute, his eyes filled with determination and compassion. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the screams subsided, replaced by heavy panting. Venom's thrashing form stilled, devoid of the malevolence that once consumed him. The spell had done its work, erasing Venom's memories and leaving him in a state of bewildered innocence. The black blob of goo trembled as the spell circles vanished, confusion evident in its every movement. It looked around, its eyes darting from face to face, trying to make sense of its surroundings. Venom's form quivered, his voice a mere whisper filled with curiosity. Who? Who am I? Where am I? The atmosphere crackled with tension and uncertainty as the group stood in the aftermath of the spell. Peter gazed down at the now innocent and confused Venom, his mind racing with the weight of the decision he was about to make. He knelt down, meeting Venom's uncertain gaze. You're Venom, Peter began, his voice gentle but firm. You're a symbiotic alien creature from another world. We're in a different universe now, and I'm sure that's beyond confusing. Venom's black goo rippled in response its eyes widening with realization and curiosity. Did you bring me here? Peter shook his head, a sense of responsibility settling over him. No, but let's leave that explanation for later. I'm Peter. I'm here to help so if you need anything just let me know, okay? Venom's tendrils twitched with anticipation, its voice barely above a whisper. Will you, will you be my host? Help me survive. Peter hesitated, his mind filled with conflicting thoughts. It would be cool to be Venom's host. But do I really want another living being attached to me for the rest of my life? He could already picture Venom popping up when he's spending some quality, alone time with MJ, blue-balling him at every turn. 
Even the possibility of using Venom for tentacle foreplay wasn't appealing whatsoever. But Peter also believed in redemption and second chances. Maybe I could just tell him to separate during private moments? He wondered, his mind being swayed by how awesome it would be to have his own symbiote. That's kind of a big decision, Peter said as he looked down at Venom, whose current appearance reminded him of a little black slime ball from fantasy anime. How about this? You can stick with me while I come to a decision. And if I end up refusing, I'll do everything I can to find a nice host for you, okay? As Peter's words sank in, Venom trembled with a mixture of gratitude and uncertainty. His host candidate didn't decline him, but he also didn't agree either. That's fine. Venom bobbed its blobby body up and down in agreement. Good, I hope we can get along well from now on, Peter says as he bends down and picks Venom up, placing him on his shoulder. You comfortable? He asked as Venom bobbed up and down again. Just as the moment settled, Tony Stark, the man who had seemingly returned from the dead, stepped forward. His eyes darted between the four Spider-Men, the captured villains, and the confused Venom. He couldn't contain his curiosity any longer. All right, everyone, can someone please explain what the hell is going on here? Tony's voice carried a mix of amusement and confusion. Tom, still emotionally overwhelmed by Tony's return, stepped forward and took a deep breath. This is all my fault. He began to explain the situation, recounting the spell gone wrong, the multiversal chaos, and the unexpected arrivals. Tony listened attentively, his expression shifting from surprise to concern. So, let me get this straight, Tony interrupted, his voice laced with disbelief. We have four Spider-Men from different universes, a group of villains I've never seen before, and I was brought back to life all because of a spell gone wrong? Tom nodded, a somber expression on his face. Yeah, it's, it's a mess. Doctor Strange and I were trying to fix my identity problem, but things just spiraled out of control, Tony sighed, his gaze shifting to Peter, who had been observing the conversation quietly. And once you fix this mess and send everyone back, I'll go back to my time and die, won't I? The weight of Tony's words hung heavy in the air, the parking lot falling into a heavy silence. Tom exclaimed, his voice tinged in a mix of fear and unwillingness. No, I refuse to let you die again. We'll find another way. Tony smiled warmly in Tom's direction. It's okay. I knew I was going to die anyway. And if I don't go back, then who will defeat Thanos? Tears began to pour down Tom's face, his entire being unwilling to lose his father figure again. But we can try to find another way. There's always another way. You know, kid, Tony steps up and places a hand on Tom's shoulder. I have a lot of regrets in my life, more than I could possibly count, but I don't think I'll regret killing that purple dinosaur Barney son of a bitch. Well, he deserved it, Tom said with a brief sorrowful laugh. But you don't. You have a daughter. She needs you. Tony's smile faltered for a moment. Yeah, but the universe needs Thanos to die, and my daughter has her mother. She'll be fine. Pepper will make sure of it. You're not taking this seriously. Tom shouted though he was stopped as Peter cleared his throat, catching everyone's attention. I may be able to come up with a fix that can make both sides happy. Peter offered a confident look on his face. But before we get into that, I need you guys to finish curing these idiots. He motions to the villains behind him. Curing? Rhodes asks in interest. Tom steps up to Peter, ignoring Rhodes for the time being. Can you actually keep him alive? I have an idea. Peter nodded as he motioned to the villains. But we need to finish with them first. And while you're doing that, I'll work on my plan. Tom looks Peter in the eyes for a moment, ultimately placing his trust in his doppelganger. Okay, I'll get it done. Just focus on whatever keeps Mr. Stark alive. He nods and walks over to the villains, ready to get back to work. Turning to the other Spider-Man, Peter motions to Tom. Keep an eye on him. I'll meet you guys back at Aunt May's in the morning. Where are you going? Toby asks curiously. Peter waves his hand, opening a golden portal. To raid the New York Sanctum for materials. Hopefully, Wong isn't around. He waved over his shoulder and disappeared into the portal. Wait for me. Lily shouted as she leaped in after him, unwilling to be left behind. After all, her father never let her go to any of the sanctums back in their universe. Natasha Romanoff, also known as Black Widow, stood on the edge of the cliff, her heart heavy with the weight of the impossible choice she faced. Hawkeye, her longtime partner and friend, stood beside her, both of them taking a moment to let the severity of the situation sink in. The wind whipped through their hair, carrying with it the whispers of their shared past, their missions, and their unbreakable bond. They had fought side by side through countless battles, but now they found themselves facing a sacrifice that neither was willing to make. Natasha knew that retrieving the soul stone meant paying a terrible price, 
but she also knew the stakes were too high to turn back. She sat down on a nearby rock, her eyes fixed on the ground as she contemplated the impossible choice before them. We've been through too much together, Clint, she said, her voice laced with determination. I can't let you die. I won't. Clint Barton, also known as Hawkeye, shook his head in disbelief. Natasha, we've lost enough. We can't lose you too. There must be another way. But Natasha knew deep down that there was no other way. She had made up her mind, and she wouldn't let Clint sacrifice himself for her, or anyone else for that matter. A silent understanding passed between them, and they both knew what had to be done. As Clint turned to face her, his eyes filled with determination, a fight broke out between them. They grappled with each other, their moves swift and precise, reflecting the years of training they had undergone together. Neither wanted to give in, each trying to overpower the other, to be the one to make the ultimate sacrifice. Their punches and kicks echoed through the desolate landscape, their cries of desperation mingling with the harsh sound of the wind. Natasha's mind raced as she fought, the weight of her decision heavy upon her. She couldn't let Clint die. She also couldn't bear the thought of losing him. They had become family, and family meant everything, especially since she has so little people that are considered family, even if they're not blood-related. With a surge of adrenaline, she mustered all her strength and managed to subdue Clint, pinning him down to the ground. Natasha, no. Clint pleaded, his voice filled with anguish. Natasha looked into his eyes, her own filled with a mix of determination and sorrow. I'm sorry, Clint, she whispered, her voice barely audible. But I can't let you die. Not for me. With a final look of understanding, Natasha pushed herself off of Clint, turning her back to him. Clint tried to scramble after her, but without hesitation, she sprinted towards the edge of the cliff, her heart pounding in her chest. As she leaped into the void, a mixture of fear and relief washed over her, and a single tear escaped her eye. But instead of hitting the ground with a sickening splat, as she expected, Natasha found herself sitting on a park bench in the heart of New York City. Confusion washed over her face as she looked around, her mind struggling to comprehend what had just happened. Beside her on the bench lay a newspaper, its headline catching her attention. She picked it up and her eyes widened as she saw a picture of Peter Parker's face beside an image of Spider-Man. The headline read, Spider-Man, Identity Revealed. What? What is this? Natasha murmured to herself, her voice barely above a whisper. She stared at the newspaper in disbelief, her mind racing with unanswered questions. That's before she saw the date printed in the paper. November 2024. Natasha Romanoff felt the weight of the past pressing down on her, unsure whether or not her sacrifice aided her friends in their fight against Thanos. I hope everything went as planned. She had managed to acquire a disguise, which was mainly a plain hoodie pulled up over her head, and made her way through the bustling streets of New York City, blending in with the crowds. The events of the past, her sacrifice on Vormer, felt distant and hazy, almost as if they belonged to another lifetime. But here she was, displaced in time, with no explanation for how or why she had been transported to the future. She had hoped that her fellow Avengers would have some answers. As she approached the entrance of the Avengers Tower, she noticed the security guards eyeing her suspiciously. Hey you there! Stop! One of the guards called out, causing Natasha's heart to race. She knew she couldn't afford to draw attention to herself, not until she had some answers. Take that hood off, and keep your hands where we can see them. Reluctantly, she complied, removing her hood and turning around slowly, her hands raised above her head. The guard's expressions turned from suspicion to shock as they recognized the face before them. Black Widow? But you're supposed to be dead, one of them stammered. Natasha gave a small, wry smile. You know, that's not the first time I've heard that. Can you take me to the team? I need to speak with them. Before the guards could respond, the doors to the Avengers Tower swung open, and a large and odd-looking group came waltzing in. Tony Stark led the way with May, Ned, MJ, Tom, Toby, Andrew, and the villains in tow. Their eyes widened in disbelief as they caught sight of Natasha, who was surrounded by guards. Natasha? Tony's voice was filled with equal parts shock and joy as he approached her. Is it really you? Natasha nodded, her eyes turning to the many onlookers around them. Maybe we should talk somewhere more private? Tony's expression softened, and he gestured for her to follow them inside, the guards parting on his command. We have a lot to catch up on. Let's go to my workshop. As they walked through the familiar halls of the Avengers Tower, Natasha couldn't help but feel a sense of both nostalgia and displacement. Everything looked the same, yet different. The memories of the past clashed with the reality of the present, creating a jumble of emotions within her. Looking over her shoulder, she squinted suspiciously as she laid eyes in the multiple Spider-Men and bound villains. What the hell is going on? 
Soon enough, Natasha took a deep breath, ready to finally uncover the truth behind her unexpected journey through time. She turned to Tony, her gaze steady. I need you to explain everything. How am I here? What happened after, after Vormer? Tony took a moment, his eyes searching hers for understanding. Natasha, you sacrificed yourself on Vormer to obtain the Soul Stone. We mourned your loss, but Thanos still needed to be dealt with. Apparently I died killing him, but then, just recently, I found myself here as well. Somehow, Strange messed up some spell, and it's bringing everyone that knows Spider-Man's identity. He went on to explain their predicament in detail. Natasha's brows furrowed as she tried to process Tony's words. This is so confusing. I'm starting to understand why Fury worried so much about magic users. Tony sighed, running a hand through his hair. Yeah, it's a pretty big mess. Feeling bad, as he held a part of the blame for all of this, Tom frowned. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. Toby clapped him on the shoulder. We'll figure this out. Besides, Peter already has a plan. Natasha's confusion deepened, but she nodded, taking in the information. So, we're not the only ones who were brought here? Tony shook his head. No, you're not. We're all trying to find a way to send everyone back to their respective universes and timelines, but it's complicated. Natasha's gaze shifted to the partially cured villains, still bound and awaiting a complete cure. What about them? Are they going back too? Tony's expression grew somber. We're working on it. One of the Spider-Mans has a plan. He has powers like Strange, so he's raiding the New York Sanctum to gather materials while we finish curing the rest of these guys. He motions to the villains. Natasha nodded, her mind racing with the possibilities and challenges that lay ahead. I want to help. Tony placed a hand on her shoulder, offering a reassuring squeeze. Yeah, sure, but before that, a flicker of suspicion sparked in Tony's eyes as his red and gold glove appeared on his hand, sending a current of electricity through Natasha which swiftly knocked her out. Shocked, Tom jumped forward to catch her as she collapsed. What the hell was that for? He shouted. We have to run some tests to make sure she is who she says she is. Tony replies as he steps past Tom, motioning for him to follow. Come on, the faster we confirm her identity, the faster we can cure these guys and meet up with that magic twin of yours. Speaking of Tom's better self, Peter stepped into the New York Sanctum, the weight of anticipation heavy in his chest. I might actually be able to save Tony's life, he thought, happy to undo the tragic scene that caused him to break down in tears in the middle of a crowded movie theater. Venom clung to his shoulder, observing their surroundings with curious eyes. Lily dashed in behind them, she couldn't contain her excitement, her gaze wide and filled with wonder. Wow, Dad, this place is amazing! Lily exclaimed, her voice filled with childlike awe. She took in the intricate details of the sanctum, her eyes glimmering with fascination. It's like stepping into Hogwarts or something. Peter smiled, watching Lily's enthusiasm. Despite her advanced intelligence, she still possessed a childlike sense of wonder and excitement. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Lily, he said, ruffling her hair affectionately. Just remember to be careful. Some of the artifacts here are pretty powerful and dangerous. Lily nodded eagerly, her eyes still wandering over the ancient relics and mystical texts. Don't worry, Dad. I'll be careful. I'm more interested in learning about them than touching them. As they made their way through the sanctum, Lily couldn't help but feel her excitement grow. She had heard about this place countless times from her father, but being here in person was an entirely different experience. The air was heavy with magic, and the atmosphere carried a sense of ancient wisdom. All right, Lily, how about a quick tour? Peter said, guiding her through the grand halls of the sanctum. He pointed out various artifacts and explained their significance, feeding Lily's thirst for knowledge. She soaked up every word, her eyes bright with curiosity. As they toured the place, Peter didn't hold back his sticky fingers. He had a mission to accomplish, and time was of the essence. He scoured the sanctum, searching for relics and books that could aid him in his plan. With each discovery, he carefully stored them away in his necklace, utilizing its pocket dimension. As Peter collected the last item, a voice echoed through the sanctum, cutting through the silence. And where do you think you're going with that? Startled, Peter turned around to see Wong, the new Sorcerer Supreme, standing in the doorway, his eyes narrowed with suspicion. Venom tensed on Peter's shoulder, a low growl rumbling from deep within its form. Lily took a step back, sensing the tension in the air. Wong, Peter greeted, his voice tinged with a brief moment of surprise. I, uh, didn't expect to run into you. Wong's gaze flickered between Peter, Venom, and Lily, his expression stern and disapproving. That much is evident he replied, his tone laced with authority. But what I'm more interested in is whether you plan on returning what you've stolen or not. 
Peter's mind raced, weighing his options. He knew that trying to explain himself would be futile. After all, he had taken dangerous artifacts and forbidden texts without permission, not to mention the fact that Strange was still imprisoned in the basement. Wong was unlikely to trust his intentions or agree to his current plan. Taking a deep breath, Peter met Wong's gaze, his voice calm but resolute. I can't return them just yet, he said, his words filled with sincerity. But I promise you, they won't be used for anything nefarious. Wong's expression hardened, his eyes narrowing further. Words alone are not enough. You have taken things that are not meant for mortal hands. The consequences could be catastrophic. Venom's tendrils twitched with restlessness, sensing the tension in the air. Lily moved closer to Peter, ready to fight alongside her father. The atmosphere crackled with anticipation, the silence heavy with the impending clash. I understand your concerns, Peter said, his voice steady. But I can't stand by and let everything fall apart. Lives are at stake. Wong's face remained unmoved, his gaze piercing through Peter. The air around them seemed to grow heavier, charged with magical energy. It was clear that Wong was not going to back down easily. Peter watched as Wong's gaze hardened, his eyes narrowing further, and the air around them seemed to grow heavy with an intense, unseen energy. Lily, sensing the tension in the air, moved closer to her father, ready to fight alongside him. Venom's tendrils twitched with restlessness, eager to join the fray. But Peter knew he had to protect them. He couldn't risk his daughter getting hurt in the battle, especially against an opponent like the Sorcerer Supreme. After all, magic was a hard ability for those without it to fight. Lily, take Venom and stand aside. Peter grabbed the black blob and handed it to his daughter. I'll handle this. Lily's eyes widened, her brows furrowing in defiance. But dad, I can help. I'm not weak, you know. Peter placed a hand on her shoulder, looking into her defiant eyes. I know you're strong, Lily, but you've never faced a sorcerer. Seeing his daughter's disappointment, he decided to cheer her up. How about this? If you promise to sit this one out, I'll teach you some magic when we get home. Does that sound fair? Instantly, Lily nodded, her expression shifting from disappointment to sheer and utter excitement. Okay, Dad, she agreed happily, her voice filled joy as she took Venom into her arms. Kick his butt. Peter gave her a reassuring smile, his eyes filled with fatherly love. I will. You and Venom stay safe. With a final pat on her head, Peter turned his attention back to Wong, who observed the exchange with a hint of approval. Wong, having no intention of hurting a child, respected Peter's decision and didn't intervene. I'll give you one last chance, Wong spoke, his voice laced with authority. Return what you've stolen and all can be forgiven. Peter smirked, finding it hard to stay serious in this situation. You know, this is a weird interaction for me. Because in my universe, you usually call me young master. Peter revealed, enjoying the confused look on Wong's face. Believe me, it's true. I didn't like it at first, but the title sort of grew on me over time. It's really shocking that you became Sorcerer Supreme in this universe. This young master is impressed, he said, nodding like a proud cultivator. It seems you can't be reasoned with, Wong spoke, his gaze hardening into a deadly glare. With a swift motion, Wong raised his hands, and the sanctum responded to his command. The air crackled with energy, and the walls seemed to shimmer with arcane symbols. From the corner of Peter's eye, he watched as the many statues and sets of armor in the sanctum came to life, ready to do Wong's bidding. Huh. Peter grunted in interest. I didn't know they could that. But Peter wasn't scared whatsoever. After all, he's faced much worse. With confidence radiating from his every move, Peter's spider sense blared as he prepared to take on the Sorcerer Supreme. In a blur of motion, Peter leaped into action, his spider-like reflexes allowing him to dodge the attacks of the animated statues with ease. With each graceful move, he closed the distance between himself and Wong, his fists charged with glimmering golden eldritch energy, which he used to destroy each animated enemy that crossed his path. Wong, impressed by Peter's agility, countered with his own display of magical prowess. He conjured gusts of wind, aiming to knock Peter off balance, but the webslinger adapted, simply sticking his feet to the ground to anchor himself, defying the sudden and invisible attack. As the battle intensified, Wong called upon the elements themselves. Flames roared to life, encircling Peter, but his spider sense allowed him to easily anticipate and dodge the fiery onslaught. With acrobatic finesse, he somersaulted through the air, maneuvering around the flames with the grace of a seasoned superhero. Finally, Peter made it through all of the obstacles and unleashed a flurry of blows upon Wong. His fists connected with precision, each strike infused with both physical and magical energy. The clash of their powers sent shockwaves rippling through the sanctum, 
causing mystical artifacts to tremble on their pedestals. You know, I take it all back, Peter says as he plants his fist in Wang's gut, sending him flying across the sanctum. I thought you'd be stronger than this. I mean, Strange put up a much better fight. Maybe he should have been Sorcerer Supreme. Hearing these slanderous words as he picked himself up off the floor, Wong couldn't help but grit his teeth in frustration. After all, that wasn't the first time he's heard those words. Everyone seemed to think Doctor Strange deserved the position. Deciding to prove Peter wrong, Wong retaliated with a dazzling display of magic, summoning ancient artifacts to bolster his defense. Weapons materialized in his hands as pieces of armor appeared on his body, each of them crackling with raw power, creating a spectacle of light and energy, illuminating the room in dazzling hues. Leaping forward with a newfound superhuman agility, Wong headed straight for Peter, ready to make him eat his words. He swung his dual swords with expertise, ready to chop his opponent to pieces. But sadly, Peter seemed to glide around each swing, gracefully dodging every attack sent his way. With each passing moment, Peter's confidence grew. He knew that Wong probably wasn't weaker than Strange. At least, not by much. But either way both were relatively easy fights. As the battle raged on, Peter seized an opportunity, using his agility to dart beneath Wong's defenses and deliver a powerful uppercut to his chin. Wong staggered backward, his jaw cracking under the pressure, momentarily stunned by the force of the blow. Sensing an opening, Peter continued his assault until Wong was on the floor, panting in exhaustion. Peter stepped forward, his gaze turned down at his opponent. He knew that Wong didn't have much fight left in him. Give up Wong, Peter said, his voice firm. It's over. Wong glared up at Peter, his defiance evident even in his beaten state. Are you prepared for the consequences of your actions? Peter shrugged uncaringly. I'm ready for whatever comes next. Peter knew that Wong was mainly talking about provoking Kamartaj, which has many powerful masters at its disposal, who would hunt him to the ends of the earth for this. But that didn't matter. After all, Peter would return to his universe soon, so they wouldn't be able to do anything. Well, not unless they use that America Girls portals, but I doubt they'll do it. Peter knew Wong would calm down after the relics and books were returned. Well, this has been fun, but I have some important business to take care of, so, Peter says as he forms a quick spell circle and slaps it down on his defeated opponent. W what? Wong struggled to feel his magic, but Peter's spell held firm, restricting his use of energy for the time being, similar to Doctor Strange. With a final surge of magical energy, Peter summoner some restraints for Wong, and the sorcerer was officially subdued. Glancing toward Lily and Venom, who watched the battle with wide eyes, all clear to see on their faces, Peter enjoyed their impressed gazes. That was great. Lily exclaimed, her voice filled with pride. Can you teach me how he made those statues move? Peter approached his daughter, a smile gracing his lips. He ruffled her hair affectionately, a surge of fatherly love filling his heart. Sure, it's actually a pretty simple spell. Though you'll have to get through the basics first. Lily nodded, determination shining in her eyes. I'll do my best. I'm sure you will, but first, Peter smiled before turning back to Wong, who was wiggling against his restraints like a worm, hoping to somehow break free. Peter dragged the bound Sorcerer Supreme, defeated and restrained, down to the Undercroft. The air grew colder, and the atmosphere in the dimly lit space was heavy with tension. Doctor Strange was confined in a cell, his powers neutralized by Peter's spell, his cape hovering around him, its cloth slumped over in boredom. As they approached, Strange's eyes widened in disbelief at the sight of his friend being dragged in. Wong? What happened? Strange's voice was laced with concern and surprise. Peter smirked, finding amusement in the unexpected reunion. Surprised to see your friend here, are you? Well, I had to borrow some stuff from the Sanctum for a spell, and Wong here found me. So, it looks like you'll have a neighbor for the time being. Wong shot Peter a disapproving glare, his restrained form struggling against the bindings. This is a grave mistake you're making. Release us immediately. Peter chuckled, his eyes glinting mischievously. He unlocked the restraints on Wong before tossing him in the cell beside Strange, allowing him some form of freedom. Sorry, but I can't let you guys out just yet. You and Strange would just get in the way. Strange, still reeling from the shock of seeing Wong captured, attempted to reason with Peter. Peter, surely we can come to an agreement. I can help you. We should work together. Peter raised an eyebrow, clearly suspicious of Strange's sudden bout of helpfulness. But then he shook his head, a smirk playing in his lips. Sorry, but I have a date with Tony Stark. Stark? The same Stark from this universe. He exclaimed, realizing that his failed spell was worsening as Peter nodded his head. This, this isn't good. 
We need to send him back immediately. You need to let me out now. Thoughts of Thanos returning filled Strange's mind, sending him into a panic, which was totally justified. After all, the murderous purple dinosaur was extremely hard to get rid of in the first place. Peter shook his head. Yeah, that's not happening. I'll deal with it. As Strange's hopes for freedom began to fade, Peter turned his back to the trapped sorcerers. I'll see you guys later. He waved nonchalantly, the gesture dismissive. With those parting words, Peter strode away, leaving Strange and Wong behind in the dimly lit undercroft. The sound of the door leading to the undercroft closing echoed through the chamber, sealing their fate for the time being. Natasha's eyes fluttered open, her vision blurry for a moment before the sight of Tony Stark's smirking face came into focus. Her head throbbed slightly, and she felt a slight tingling sensation coursing through her body, remnants of the electrocution she had endured moments ago. She sat up, feeling a bit disoriented but quickly regained her composure. Congratulations, Nat. You passed the test, Tony said, his grin widening as he offered a hand to help her up. You're not a clone, shapeshifter, robot, or any other sort of imposter. Natasha scowled and swatted his hand away, standing on her own. Test? Did you really have to electrocute me to prove my identity? She asked as he looked away awkwardly. But I do understand the need for caution. Though you could have just asked for a blood sample or something. Tony chuckled. Hey, desperate times call for desperate measures. I needed to make sure you were really you. Well, next time, maybe give me a heads up, Natasha replied, her tone still slightly annoyed. Tony's smile softened into a more genuine expression. Fair enough. Anyway, we're glad to have you here. Now that we're all convinced of your identity, let's get to work. Tom stepped forward, eager to get back on track. Can we finally start curing the others now? Tony nodded. Sure. I'll give you full access to my lab, and we can use the resources here to make the cures. As everyone made their way through Tony's state-of-the-art lab, the atmosphere was a mix of hope and urgency. They had come so far and had overcome many obstacles, but the finish line was still ahead of them. The lab was an impressive sight, filled with advanced technology and equipment. Tom, Tony, Andrew, and Toby quickly got to work, using their scientific and engineering expertise to analyze the remaining villain's DNA. Meanwhile, Natasha and the rest of the non-scientific people in the room observed from the sidelines, impressed by the work being done. Hours passed in a blur as they tested different combinations and refined all sorts of serums and antidote. They encountered setbacks and moments of frustration since Lizard and Green Goblin's little metamorphosis made them harder to study, but they persevered. The breakthroughs finally came when the sun began to rise on the horizon, illuminating the workshop with natural light. Tom, Toby, and Andrew set out to administer the cure to the defeated villains, starting with the lizard, Dr. Kurt Connors. They placed an oversized mask over his scaly, sleeping face and turned a knob on a canister, releasing a green gas into the mask. They watched as Dr. Connors breathed in the gas, and gradually, his monstrous form began to morph and shrink. The scales receded, and he returned to his human form, still unconscious but no longer the lizard. Next, they turned their attention to the green goblin, who was still very green. They injected Norman with the perfected serum, watching as the green-skinned, goblin-like features gradually vanished, revealing the aged face of the man beneath the madness. Though his madness should be gone with this, as the last traces of the goblin serum dissipated, Norman opened his eyes, confusion and fear evident in his expression. What, what happened? He asked, looking around at the faces of the Spider-Man. Toby stepped forward, his voice firm but compassionate. You've been through a lot, Norman. But you're safe now. We'll explain everything once everyone else is cured. Finally, it was time for Electro. Andrew approached him, a mix of determination and sympathy in his eyes. Electro still seemed lost in his thoughts, wrestling with his past actions and contemplating the possibility of a different path. I don't deserve to be a hero, Electro mumbled, his voice tinged with sadness. I've done terrible things. Andrew placed a device on Electro's chest, and it began to hum softly, drawing the excess electricity out of his body. We all make mistakes, Andrew said gently, but it's never too late to change and make amends. The electric blue energy around Electro started to dissipate, leaving him weakened but no longer a threat. The process was swift and painless, and when it was over Andrew stood by him, offering a hand of support. Electro looked up at Andrew with a mixture of relief and sorrow. Thank you, he whispered. Andrew smiled warmly. You're welcome. And it's good to have to back, Max. As the morning sun continued its rise, the Spider-Men stood in the lab, victorious but exhausted. The villains were no longer a danger, and they were one step closer to finding a way back to their own universes. We've made progress, but there's still more to do, Toby said, his voice filled with determination. 
We need to meet up with Peter and figure out what to do next. May stepped up and gestured to the former villains. What about them? We'll just have to take M with us? Tony answers, unwilling to leave them in his workshop. Unless we're walking or taking the subway, we'll need a few cars to get there. Tom says, missing Peter's portals already. Tony nodded and whipped out his phone. I'll call for a bus. The sun had fully risen by the time Tom and the rest of the group left the Avengers Tower, heading towards his and May's apartment. They rode a luxury bus through the busy streets of New York City, relaxed now that the group of villains weren't a threat anymore. As they approached the familiar building, Tom's heart raced with anticipation and worry. He hoped that Peter didn't face any setbacks at the Sanctum, and prayed that everything was going smoothly on his end. However, as they reached the entrance to the apartment, they were greeted not by Peter but by three menacing figures. A huge bald-headed man in a black suit stood menacingly, towering over two others. A messy-haired woman in a lab coat, and an ash-skinned man with white, slicked back hair. Kingpin, Olivia Octavius, and Tombstone. They stood there, their expressions cold and calculating, seemingly waiting for somebody's arrival. Tombstone, a tall figure with impenetrable skin and superhuman strength, moved forward as they stepped out of the bus, a cruel grin spreading across his face. Well, 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 if it ain't Spider-Man Dash he began to taunt, but froze in place as three separate Spider-Men appeared. Uh, boss, are there supposed to be three of them? One or three insect? It makes no difference. Kingpin shrugged it off. Olivia spoke up, an interested gleam in her eyes. Let's just kill them already, she said, her tentacles appeared from under her lab coat. Just try to keep their bodies intact. I need to dissect them for my research. Doc Ock's eyes widened as he stepped out of the bus. Is, is that? He asked in shock, his own tentacles looming behind him. Tom clenched his fists, his eyes narrowing as he glared at Tombstone and the rest. I take it you're from another universe? He asked confidently. After all, he has two other Spider-Men, Iron Man and War Machine at his back. He could confidently face an entire army right now. As Tom prepared for a possible fight, Olivia Octavius smirked in his direction. I see we aren't the only ones, she said, her eyes moving to her male counterpart. Fascinating. It is, isn't it? Otto replied as he eyed her up and down. I never thought in a million years that I'd meet myself from another universe, or that I'd be a woman, no offense, none taken. Olivia shakes her head uncaringly. I'm quite glad you're here actually. I thought I'd only be dissecting Spider-Man today, but who knew I'd be able to cut myself open? This is truly a blessing from my research. Tony stepped up, his red and gold suit quickly building itself along his body, encasing him in a form-fitting set of high-tech armor. You know, I've dealt with some crazy women in my life. One even tried to cut off my... He gestures down at his crotch, but you might just be the worst I've ever met. Can we not make everything about the women you've slept with? Rhodes sighs as he steps up beside Tony, his armor covering his body as well. I never said that I slept with her, Tony says as he turns to Rhodes, a grin forming in his face. But I did. Aunt May frowned alongside MJ. Men are disgusting. MJ wanted to agree but then she remembered her sweet boyfriend and shook her head. No, Tony Stark is disgusting. Doing his best to ignore his group, Tom turned to Kingpin and his goons his voice laced with defiance. If you're from another universe, then give yourselves up and we'll help you as best as we can. Kingpin chuckled darkly as his giant hands tightened into fists. Ah, the arrogance of youth. It will be a pleasure to put you all in your place. Olivia's tentacles twitched with anticipation. I've been waiting for a chance to dissect a Spider-Man, and now I get three for the price of one, and myself included. Lucky me. Tombstone cracked his knuckles, grinning menacingly. Enough talk. Let's get the killing started, shall we? As the tension in the air reached its peak, everyone split off into teams, picking an opponent at random, except for Natasha, who stayed behind to protect the weaker portion of the group. Tom, clad in his Spider-Man suit, and Tony, encased in his armor, stood side by side, facing Tombstone. His imposing frame was a stark contrast to their slender and agile forms, but they remained undeterred. Tombstone cracked his knuckles, a wicked grin spreading across his face. I hope you two are ready for a beating. I've taken down plenty of wannabe heroes in my time, and you'll be no different. Tom's eyes narrowed, his spider sense tingling as he prepared for the fight. We'll see about that, he retorted confidently, his muscles tensing in anticipation as he turned to Tony. Let's show him what we're made of. Tony smirked under his helmet. Oh, I've been itching for a fight ever since I got back. With a burst of energy, Tony shot forward, flying at incredible speed toward Tombstone. 
The air crackled with the force of his repulsor rays as he unleashed a barrage of energy blast. Tombstone, however, proved to be surprisingly agile for his size, effortlessly dodging the attacks and lunging forward to deliver a powerful punch. Iron Man managed to evade the strike, but it was clear that Tombstone's strength was no joke. The sheer force behind his blows sent shockwaves through the ground, causing the surrounding area to shake. Meanwhile, Tom relied on his enhanced reflexes and acrobatic skills to dart around Tombstone, striking him with precision blows whenever an opening presented itself. His agility allowed him to evade the brute's heavy attacks, but he knew that he couldn't rely on evasion alone. Analyzing the situation, Tom looked for an opportunity to exploit Tombstone's weaknesses. He noticed that while the villain was strong and durable, his speed was not as impressive. With this realization, Tom came up with a plan. Hey, I've got an idea. Tom called out to Tony, whilst keeping his distance from Tombstone. What is it? Tony replied, keeping his eyes on the pale brute. Keep him distracted with your ranged attack. I'll go for his legs, Tom said, his mind racing with the strategy. Without hesitation, Iron Man unleashed another volley of repulsor blasts, drawing Tombstone's attention toward him. As he focused on Tony, Tom sprang into action. He used his web shooters to create webs beneath Tombstone's feet, entangling his legs and restricting his movement. Tombstone roared in frustration, trying to break free from the sticky trap, but Tom continued to shoot more webs, securing him in place. Nice work, kid! Tony called out, impressed by Tom's quick thinking. With Tombstone temporarily immobilized, Iron Man swooped in, his gauntlets charged with energy. He unleashed a powerful beam of energy directly at the brute's chest, sending him crashing backward into a nearby building. The impact created a cloud of dust and debris, obscuring their view for a moment. But as the dust settled, they saw Tombstone lying on the ground, knocked out and defeated. Tom landed gracefully beside Tony, feeling the rush of victory. That was easier than I expected. He remarked, almost surprised. Tony chuckled. Well, it was two against one, and we make a pretty good team, but let's not get too cocky. Leave that to me. He smirked as the walked over and restrained their opponent. As Tom and Tony began their fight with Tombstone, the confrontation between Kingpin and the team of Andrew and War Machine was just getting started as well. The towering figure of Wilson Fisk, also known as Kingpin, exuded an intimidating aura. His immense size and strength made him a formidable opponent, and he seemed entirely unfazed by the presence of his two opponents. Andrew took a deep breath, preparing for the battle to come. He didn't know anything about his opponent, so he wasn't sure whether taking on someone like Kingpin would be an easy task or not, but he wouldn't back down either way. War Machine, clad in his powerful suit of armor, stood confidently beside Andrew. Damn, how tall do you think this guy is? He asked curiously. Because he can't be less than nine feet tall. And that's a conservative guess. Andrew nodded, also in astonishment by Kingpin's size. I'm more shocked by how wide he is. Unwilling to listen any longer, Kingpin lunged forward, closing the distance between him and the two heroes with astonishing speed for someone of his size. He swung his massive fist at Andrew, who managed to dodge just in time, the rush of wind from the punch sending a shiver down his spine. War Machine unleashed a barrage of repulsor blasts from his gauntlets, trying to keep Kingpin at bay. The powerful energy beam struck the crime lord's thick hide, but he barely flinched, his dark eyes locking onto his targets. Andrew used his agility to move around Kingpin, evading his punches and strikes with impressive skill. He delivered quick, precise blows to Kingpin's midsection and legs, trying to find weak points in his defenses. However, Kingpin's durability was astounding. Each punch from Andrew seemed to have little effect on the massive crime lord. Kingpin retaliated with a powerful Spartan kick that sent Andrew flying back, crashing into a nearby car. War Machine, witnessing the exchange, quickly adjusted his strategy. He unleashed a barrage of missiles from his shoulders, aiming to disorient Kingpin and create an opening for Andrew to regroup. The missiles exploded around Kingpin, causing plumes of smoke and debris to fill the air. In the midst of the chaos, Andrew took the opportunity to recover and assess the situation. Kingpin emerged from the smoke, his suit burning and covered in soot, but his resolve unshaken. Is that all you've got? He taunted, his deep voice resonating with arrogance. Andrew gritted his teeth, refusing to be discouraged. He knew that taking on Kingpin head-on would be futile. He needed a different approach. With a quick burst of webbing, Andrew swung to a distance, surveying the battlefield with a thoughtful look on his face. While Andrew was thinking of a plan, War Machine engaging Kingpin once again, firing his repulsor blasts with increased intensity. He strafed around the crime lord, trying to stay agile and avoid his crushing blows. 
Meanwhile, Andrew quickly formulated a plan. He needed to take advantage of Kingpin's size and use his momentum against him. With a determined look in his eyes, Andrew swung back into the fray. War Machine moved away just in time as Andrew shot a webline at Kingpin's arm, yanking it backward. The sudden force caused Kingpin to stumble, momentarily losing his balance. Andrew seized the opportunity, springing forward and delivering a fully powered kick to Kingpin's torso, hoping to send the behemoth flying. Kingpin roared in pain as he stumbled back a few steps, but his resolve remained unwavering. He retaliated with a powerful backhand, sending Andrew tumbling across the ground. War Machine rushed to Andrew's aid, unleashing a barrage of missiles at Kingpin to draw his attention away from the fallen hero. The explosive display created a momentary distraction, allowing Andrew to catch his breath. But Kingpin proved to be relentless. He pushed through the smoke and debris. His eyes locked onto Andrew and rode. With a fierce determination, he charged forward, his footsteps creating tremors in the ground. Andrew knew they had to end this quickly. He couldn't let Kingpin get the upper hand again. With newfound resolve, Andrew shot a line of web at War Machine's back. Quick, give me a boost, Andrew called out. War Machine understood the plan and activated his repulsor thrusters, soaring toward Kingpin at full speed, whilst dragging Andrew behind him. Kingpin saw Rhodes coming from a mile away, but his eyes widened when instead of crashing into him, as he expected, War Machine pulled up and veered off course, revealing Andrew torpedoing in his direction. Andrew unleashed a powerful punch, imbued with the combined force of his spider strength and War Machine's propulsion. The punch connected with Kingpin's jaw, sending shockwaves through the crime lord's massive frame. For a moment, Kingpin staggered, his eyes wide with surprise. Andrew used this moment to his advantage, delivering a swift series of blows to Kingpin's head, trying to put the giant to sleep. Finally, with one last powerful hit to the forehead, Andrew sent Kingpin crashing to the ground, his colossal figure causing the earth to tremble upon impact. War Machine landed beside Andrew, both of them catching their breath after the intense battle. Nice work, War Machine said, giving Andrew a nod of approval. Andrew smiled, feeling a mix of relief and satisfaction. Thanks, you too. As Andrew and Rhodes battled the giant Kingpin, Toby and Otto Octavius faced off against their formidable opponent, Olivia Octavius. Olivia stood confidently, her tentacles swaying ominously behind her as she grinned at her newfound test subjects. Well, let's get this show on the road. I'd like to get your bodies in my lab by the end of the day. She purred, her voice laced with both arrogance and excitement. Toby kept his emotions in check, his experience as Spider-Man guiding his actions. He knew that facing Olivia would be no easy feat, especially given her twisted and ruthless nature. If you give yourself up, we can help you, he replied calmly as he gestures to the man beside him. Especially if you have the same problem as Otto. Otto, on the other hand, could not hide his astonishment at seeing Olivia. He examined her with both fascination and concern. It's remarkable, he mused, the differences and similarities in our lives, all leading to this moment. Olivia scoffed. Spare me the philosophical musings. I'm not interested in your petty reflections. I'm here for one thing only. Her tentacles thrashed in excitement, almost like a predator sensing its prey. Now, try not to get too hurt. I'd hate to ruin a perfectly good cadaver. Toby and Otto exchanged a quick glance, silently communicating their strategy. They knew that facing Olivia together was their best chance at success. Without further delay, Olivia lunged forward, her tentacles striking with deadly precision. Toby's spider sense tingled, allowing him to dodge her attacks with remarkable agility. Meanwhile, Otto utilized his mechanical prowess, devising a plan to neutralize Olivia's tentacles. He struck out with his metallic tentacles, quickly maneuvering around her green tentacles, hoping to entangle them. Olivia hissed in frustration, but her intellect was just as formidable as her physical prowess. She manipulated the tentacles, swiftly breaking free from Otto's hold and countering Toby's attacks. Toby and Olivia engaged in a fast-paced battle of agility and strategy. He used his experience and knowledge of his powers to outmaneuver Olivia's tentacles, dodging and weaving through her attacks with skillful precision. However, Olivia was relentless. She adapted to Toby's movements, anticipating his next steps. Her tentacles struck with blinding speed, forcing Toby to remain on the defensive. Toby could feel the weight of the battle, the pressure mounting as Olivia's attacks seemed never-ending. He knew he couldn't keep up this defensive stance forever, and they needed a way to turn the tide of the fight. Seeing Toby struggle, Otto realized that they needed to combine their efforts more effectively. Toby, distract her. I have a plan, Otto called out, his mind working quickly to devise a strategy. 
Toby nodded and engaged Olivia head-on, using his agility to keep her occupied and dodging her tentacles as best as he could. He knew he needed to create an opening for Otto to execute his plan. Meanwhile, Otto's mechanical tentacles whirred and shifted as he analyzed Olivia's movements. He spotted a pattern in her attacks, a brief moment when she was momentarily off balance after striking with a single tentacle. Seizing the opportunity, Otto took action. He swiftly joined the battle once again and maneuvered one of his tentacles to grab Olivia's outstretched tentacle midswing, effectively restraining it. Olivia growled in frustration, trying to break free, but Otto's hold was unyielding. With the tentacle immobilized, Olivia was momentarily vulnerable. Toby, seeing the chance, delivered a powerful kick to her midsection, forcing her back and causing her tentacles to flop to the floor. Acting quickly, Otto struck out, pinning all four of his tentacles against Olivia's, completely restrained by her male counterpart's mechanical appendages. She struggled against the grip, but it was clear that she couldn't break free easily. Toby didn't waste a second. He swiftly swung his webs into action, firing a volley of webbing to wrap around Olivia's torso and arms, further restraining her movements. Toby sighed in relief, a sense of satisfaction washing over him. Good job, Doc, he said, extending his hand to shake Otto's. We'll make a hero out of you yet. Otto accepted the gesture, a hint of a smile tugging at the corners of his lips. The same goes for you. I couldn't have done it without your assistance. As each separate battle came to an end, with each villain restrained and captured, the group suddenly heard a familiar voice calling out to them. Yo, did we miss anything exciting? They turned to see another Peter, stepping out a portal, alongside his cute daughter Lily, who was holding Venom in her arms like a soft, plushy doll. The aftermath of the intense battles left the group of Spider-Men and their allies with a mix of exhaustion and triumph. The defeated three, Kingpin, Olivia Octavius, and Tombstone, were securely bound and restrained, unable to cause any further trouble. With their adversaries taken care of, the focus now shifted to Peter life saving spell and ultimately sending everyone back to their respective universes. As Peter returned from the New York Sanctum, he carried all of the necessary supplies in his necklace. He noticed the restrained new arrivals and instantly recognized them from his trip to Miles' universe. Whether they were actually from his universe or a parallel one was a mystery. Peter turned to the group, Lily standing at his side. What's with these guys? They were waiting here when we arrived. Tom quickly explained everything that happened before Peter's arrival. Peter nodded. We'll deal with them later. Right now, our priority is my spell. He says as he looks up at the sky. After all, we're running out of time. Following Peter's gaze, everyone looked up at the sky, finding it in perfect condition. They began to wonder if he could see something that they couldn't. And they would be correct. Sending a small amount of eldritch energy into his eyes, Peter could see the tiny purple cracks beginning to form along the blue sky. Cracks leading to other universes, filled with all sorts of dangerous beings. Strange spell has been active for far too long, and it's starting to grow into an even bigger problem. We only have until sunset, Peter thought as he prepared to speed things along. Turning back to the bewildered group, Peter noticed Natasha standing among them. I take it she was pulled out of her time as well? He asked. Tony nodded. Yeah, don't worry. I've already checked her over. She's the real Natasha. He says as he frowns thoughtfully. Will your spell be able to work for two people? Because if not, I'd rather you save Natasha. Peter shook his head firmly. No, that won't be necessary. I grabbed some extra supplies just in case, so I can make it work. He said as he turned to Natasha and smiled. It's good to see you, Natasha, or at least a version of you. You know, in my universe, you're one of the few teachers I've ever had. You, the Ancient One, a few masters in Kamartage, and that's about it. What about school? Lily asks as she squeezed Venom on her arms. Meh, I don't count them. Peter shrugged. After all, they didn't really teach him anything that he didn't already know. Natasha's curiosity peaked as she heard Peter's words. Nice to meet you, Peter, she said with a small smile, extending her hand. I'm not sure what happened in your universe, but I'm glad I could help. Peter took her hand, his respect evident in his eyes. It's an honor to meet you too, Natasha. So, did you run into any problems? Tom asked. MJ stepped up as well. Yeah, is Doctor Strange still in his cell? Yeah, he's still locked up. And nah, it went pretty smooth. Peter shook his head. Though the Sorcerer Supreme did caught me stealing, Peter revealed, catching everyone off guard. And you call that smooth? Tony shouted in a mix of exasperation and worry. Peter shrugged. Meh, he didn't put up much of a fight. We had a bit of a battle, and then I locked him up with Strange in the Undercroft cells. He shouldn't cause us any trouble. 
Everyone was shocked to hear that Peter had defeated the Sorcerer Supreme, but Peter downplayed it, saying he was just a bit weaker than Strange, so it wasn't a massive fight. Lily, always proud of her father, chimed in. You should have seen it. She boasted with a huge smile on her face. Dad even promised to teach me magic when we get home. Tony chuckled at her enthusiasm, then turned to Peter. So, you can save both of us? He asked once again, for clarification. Without messing anything up, Thanos still dies and the universe won't implode. Peter nodded confidently. Yes, I can make it work. We'll get everyone back to their universes and save both you and Natasha. Still not fully convinced, Tony expressed concern about using May's apartment, suggesting they use the Avengers Tower instead. Peter agreed, knowing it was a more suitable location for the delicate spell. He glanced at Kingpin, who was still unconscious, and realized he wouldn't even fit through May's front door. Good call. Let's head to the tower. We have everything we need, and I can set up the spell there, Peter suggested as he waved his hand, conjuring a portal to the roof of the tower. As the group piled into the portal, leaving behind the bus they had arrived in and the wreckage of their previous battle, police sirens could be heard in the distance, growing closer and closer. It seems that super-powered fights were breaking out all over the city lately, but they always seemed to arrive just a minute too late to catch anyone. The group arrived at the Avengers Tower, where Tony and Rhodes led Peter to a large and open room suitable for his spellcasting. As Peter started pulling out artifacts, odd ingredients, and ancient tomes from his storage necklace, Tony couldn't help but be curious about the nature of the spell. So, what exactly is this spell going to do? Tony asked, his eyes flickering with a mix of fascination and concern. Peter continued setting up the components, drawing intricate symbols on the floor with blood, and placing ingredients at crucial points around the room. He consulted the ancient books he had taken out, double-checking every detail. This spell will allow us to save you and Natasha, while also sending you back to finish off your last moments, Peter explained as he worked diligently. After all, we have to make sure your past actions, the ones that were crucial to this universe, still happen. Tony raised an eyebrow, trying to comprehend the complexity of the situation. You're going to send us back to our deaths? He asked, a hint of uncertainty in his voice. Not exactly, Peter clarified, pausing for a moment to meet Tony's gaze. You both have to go back to those moments in time, but I have a plan to get around the whole dying part. The group leaned in, curious to hear Peter's solution. I'll create soulless and mindless clones of both you and Natasha, Peter explained. I'll tie your astral bodies to the clones and send them back to your respective timelines, where you'll be able to perform the necessary actions. Once you've fulfilled your destinies and faced your deaths, I'll use a spell from this book I got from the New York Sanctum to pull your astral bodies to back to your main bodies here. He said as he held up an aged, dusty tome. The room filled with a mix of confusion and intrigue as Peter held up the dusty book. What's an astral body? Lily asked, her eyes wide with curiosity. It's like your soul and conscious mind mixed together, Peter explained with a warm smile. Think of it as the essence of who you are spiritually and mentally. Tom frowned thoughtfully. Aren't the clones people too? I don't think we should be sending them to their deaths. Peter shook his head. No, the clones will only appear human. I'm not giving them an astral body. And even if I wanted to, it would be extremely difficult to do so. After all, creating actual life is hard. Which is why we have to put Tony and Natasha's astral bodies inside of them. But didn't you make me with magic? Lily asks curiously. Do I have an astral body? I. Peter froze for a moment. I don't know. He answered truthfully. Is there a way to find out? Lily asked with a small frown on her face. Peter nodded. Yeah, but are you sure you want to know? Yes. Lily answered instantly. Okay, hold still. Peter says as he reaches out and grasps Lily by the top of her head. And with a single pull, everyone watched as a ghost-like transparent Lily came flying out. Venom, catch her. In an instant, Venom morphed into a small bed, which Lily's pilotless physical body collapsed on. Whoa! Ghost Lily exclaimed in awe as she left her father's grasp and floated around. This is so cool. I guess you do have an astral body. Peter muttered in shock. I wonder how I did that? Tony processed the information, his analytical mind trying to grasp the intricacies of the spell. So, you'll pull our souls out like that, stick them in these clones and send us to die in our timelines, but then our souls will be brought back here? He asked, seeking confirmation. Exactly, Peter nodded. It's a way to cheat death, allowing you both to continue living here. This is the best I can do on such short notice. If I had a week or two, then maybe I could come up with a better plan. The room fell silent as everyone absorbed the gravity of Peter's plan. 
The weight of altering time and tampering with life and death hung heavily in the air. But Peter was confident in his abilities and knew the risks were worth it to save Tony and Natasha. While everyone was shocked, processing all of the information they were just given, Peter continued readying his spell, whilst Lily dashed around the room, looking like a cute little poltergeist. Before diving into the critical preparations for the spell, Peter turned to the group, who were watching him in interest, his eyes lingering on the more scientifically minded end of them. Tony, Tom, Toby, and Andrew in particular. Hey, Peter called, his tone dismissive. Make yourselves useful while I'm getting the spell ready. I need you to check over Kingpin, Olivia, and Tombstone. Try to cure them like we did with the others. Tony crossed his arms, looking reluctant. Can't we just wait and watch you do your thing? We don't want to miss it. Peter roller his eyes. If you want to learn magic, then bed the Sorcerer Supreme to accept you into Kamarta. Besides, I won't be done for at least another three or four hours. You won't miss any magic? Tony hesitantly nodded in agreement. Fine, he said, ideas of visiting Kamartaj swirling inside his head. Andrew sighed, accepting the responsibility. All right, we'll do it, but we expect you to call us when it's time to do the magic. I don't want to miss it. Sure, Peter said with a small grin. Now, I doubt Kingpin can be cured. I've run not him before and his abilities seem inborn, but Olivia Octavius most likely has a malfunctioning inhibitor chip, just like Otto. If we can fix that, she should return to her senses. And as for Tombstone, I have no idea how he gained his powers, so good luck with that. With their mission clear, the four Spider-Men reluctantly left Peter to his work and proceeded to drag the restrained and now awakening villains toward Tony's lab. The villains struggled and protested, but their efforts were in vain against the combined strength of the three-season Spider-Man and Iron Man Tony, Tom, Toby, and Andrew stood in Tony's high-tech lab, the subdued villains, Kingpin, Olivia Octavius, and Tombstone, securely restrained nearby. The room hummed with the sounds of machines and computers, and the air was tense from the venomous glares that the prisoners were sending their captors. Tony ran a diagnostic scan on Kingpin, hoping to find some way to cure him, but as expected, the results showed that Kingpin's immense power was an inherent genetic trait rather than the result of an accident or experiment gone awry. Well, Peter was right, Tony muttered, studying the data on the holographic screen. Kingpin's abilities seem to be an innate part of his biology. There's no accident or scientific mishap we can reverse, Tom sighed, disappointment evident in his voice. So, he'll stay like that forever? Hey! Fisk shouted in protest, not liking how Tom said that. It appears so, Tony confirmed with a frown, ignoring the prisoner. His muscle and bone density are off the charts, which explains his superhuman strength. He's basically just an oversized human, but that alone makes him superhuman. Toby chimed in, concern etched on his face. What about Olivia? Can we help her? Tony nodded and motioned for them to follow him. They moved to a separate area of the lab where Olivia Octavius was restrained. She glared at them, still filled with anger and madness, but they could sense a flicker of despair in her eyes. Get away from me! She shouted as they inched closer and closer. I won't be dissected, like some common lab rat. Tom took a step closer to her, hoping to calm her down. Olivia, we can help you, just like we did for Otto. You don't have to be scared. We won't hurt you. Olivia scoffed, but there was a hint of desperation in her voice. And why should I believe you? Why would you help me? Because we're the good guys? Andrew stated the obvious. I mean, when's the last time you've met a Spider-Man that dissects and tortures people? Geez. Just relax. Tony nodded, showing her the inhibitor chip he had prepared, as well as a holographic schematic of her extra appendages. It seems that you never installed an inhibitor chip in your tentacles, so we'll go ahead and do that for you. With this, you'll hopefully stop being crazy. If not, well, I guess you'll end up somebody else's problem. Olivia hesitated for a moment, but the unwillingness in her eyes was undeniable. Thankfully, they didn't need her permission, as she was restrained completely, so they simply installed the chip into the back of her neck. The transformation was immediate. The malicious gleam in her eyes vanished, replaced with a mixture of relief and surprise. Oh my! It's like a, a weight has been lifted from my mind, she said, her voice tinged with wonder. This, this is incredible. T thank you. Tom smiled, glad to see her mind slowly restore itself to sanity. You're welcome, Olivia. Just don't remove or damage the chip and you should be fine. The group then turned their attention to Tombstone, the ashen-skinned gangster, who sat quietly, awaiting his fate. He seemed to enjoy his physically superior condition, so did not welcome their little experiments. Toby approached him and asked gently, Do you know how you got your powers? Tombstone shook his head. 
not much. It was a long time ago, and it all happened so fast. And even if I did know, I wouldn't tell you. Of course, he knew exactly what happened. Tombstone was shot and sent tumbling into a room with the experimental chemical diox, 3, which gave him enhanced strength, speed, and durability. Tony examined the test results they had gathered and devised a serum that could potentially reverse Tombstone's transformation. They dragged him to an airtight room and locked him inside while they released the serum in gas form. As the serum misted into the sealed room, encompassing his body, Tombstone's skin began to lose its ashen hue, and his muscles gradually returned to a more human appearance. Within seconds, he sat before them as a regular-looking man. Tombstone froze in disbelief as he felt all of his strength disappear. I'm normal again, he whispered in dread. Andrew smiled warmly. Yes, you are. Now, you have a chance to start anew. Tombstone merely glared in his direction, pissed off at his predicament. Only Olivia expressed her gratitude for their help, and even shed some tears of relief. Despite her past actions, she was given a second chance, and she was determined to make the most of it. Meanwhile, back in the spacious room, Peter continued his intense preparation for the spell. Sweat dripped from his brow, as he tirelessly and meticulously prepared every detail of the spells. The tiny purple cracks in the sky above continued to grow and multiply, threatening to unleash chaos upon the multiverse. Lily sat on a nearby chair, back in her physical body with Venom sat on her lap, watching her father work tirelessly. She could see the crazy amount of effort and detail that he was putting into it, which only made him look cooler in her eyes. Dad, are you sure you can handle this alone? Lily asked, concern lacing her voice. Peter looked up, giving her a reassuring smile. I'll be fine, sweetheart. I've done some pretty difficult spells before, but this one might be the biggest one yet. He looked up from his work for a moment, smirking in his daughter's direction. I do love a good challenge though. Lily couldn't help but smile in return, her trust in her father unwavering. Just be careful, okay? We need you. I promise, Peter replied, returning to his work. Now, I need you to do something for me, Lily. What is it? Lily asked, eager to help in any way she could. Go and get the others, Peter instructed as he stood up and admired his work. Lily nodded and hopped to her feet. Sure, do you need a few more hands? Should I bring Tony? No, I'm already done, Peter stated, surprising her. The ritual was ready, or rather both rituals were ready. One to make the clones and another to bind Tony and Natasha's astral forms to said bodies, while also anchoring them to this timeline. The room looked like a murder scene at a crazed cult. Blood and body parts covered the room in intricate designs alongside the oddest-looking objects and tomes. If any normal person were to arrive and see this, they would shriek and pass out or run for the police. Excited to see the rituals in action, Lily rushed out of the room to gather everyone. I'll be right back. Don't start without me. Moments passed before the room was full, and the sun began its descent toward the horizon. They only had an hour at most before he would have to send everyone back to their respective timelines and universes. This is it, Peter announced with a mixture of determination and trepidation. Once the spell is complete, everyone needs to be ready to return to their respective universes immediately. The longer we linger here, the more dangerous it becomes. But before that, Peter says as he pulls out three matching smartphones, Tom, Toby, and Andrew looked at him in confusion as he handed them over. And as they hesitantly took the phones, each screen lit up as an application opened, filling the scene and revealing a message. Welcome to the Spider-Verse group chat. Tom, Toby, and Andrew looked at each other, confused by what they've been given. What's this? Tom asked. It's a way for all of us Spider-People to stay connected across the multiverse, Peter explained. I created it during my last visit to another universe, and it already has some members. He instructed them to open the chat on the three phones, revealing an active chat room. Spider-Pig. Did everyone else get that notification? Eyes Gwen. Yeah. Did Peter add more members to the chat? Miles, it's crazy that he has time to find new members, but can't find the time to talk to us unamused face Ben, right? He doesn't even know about me and MJ's engagement face with steam from nose painty. Isn't it just your ex-wife? Noir, yeah you've already married that dame once before. Just let us know when you're divorced again neutral face Ben. These are the members already in the chat, Peter continued, ignoring their conversation altogether. They're all from different universes just like us. With the group chat, we can share information and be there for each other whenever we need help or support. Toby raised an eyebrow, impressed by the idea. So, we're part of a superhero support group? Essentially, yes, Peter nodded with a grin. But I like to think of it as more of a Discord channel, where we call all keep in touch. Andrew seemed intrigued but also a bit hesitant. 
What if we accidentally reveal something that alters the course of someone's universe? Peter shook his head. That's the point. I made this chat so you guys can be better equipped to overcome any obstacles. He explained matter-of-factly. Need information on a villain or help with some tech, or possibly some romantic advice. Ask the chat and we can help. Though based on what we just witnessed, they may also tease you a bit along the way. Isn't that dangerous? Andrew asked. Shouldn't we try not to alter our destinies or whatever? Dude. Peter sighed in exasperation. You've been watching too many sci-fi movies. This is the real world. Getting some info or advice from a chat room isn't going to bring about the end of time and space. Tom smiled, admiring his new phone. This is actually pretty cool. I'd like to be a part of it. Me too. Toby chimed in, sharing Tom's sentiment. Andrew, convinced, nodded in agreement. All right, count me in. Welcome to the team, Peter said with a smile as they familiarized themselves with the chat app. Feel free to introduce yourselves to the other members later. After all, we have to dash Tony cut in, interrupting Peter mid-sentence. Do we get one of those as well? If not, how much do I have to pay to get one? He asked, excited at the possibility of studying messages that travel through the multiverse. And he wasn't the only one that wanted their own phone. Almost everyone in the room stared at Tom, Toby, and Andrew and their phones with envious gazes. No, Peter flat out refused. Sorry, but this is kind of a spider people only sort of thing. The three Spider-Men glanced at each other, feeling a bit smug after hearing that, as if they were VIPs or something. They were now part of a unique community, connected with their counterparts all across the multiverse. Ignoring the depressed and almost hostile feeling that suddenly filled the room, Peter brought everyone back on track. All right, let's finish these rituals and get everyone back to where they belong. The Avengers Tower was abuzz with anticipation as Peter prepared to perform the intricate rituals that currently filled the room. The whole place was bathed in the eerie glow of eldritch energy as Peter stood at the center, his very being pulsating with power. Lily watched her father with wide eyes, her heart filled with both excitement and admiration. All right, everyone, Peter called out, gathering the attention of the group. This is the first part of the spell. I'm going to create the clones now, and then we'll proceed with the second part to bind their astral forms. Stay back, and don't, under any circumstances, interrupt the ritual. He added, a very serious look on his face. They all nodded in understanding, knowing the importance of precision in magical workings. They watched in awe as Peter began the spell, his hands tracing complex patterns in the air. The room seemed to tremble with energy as the symbols took shape, glowing with otherworldly power. The components laid out around the room glowed in response, each contributing to the spell's power. Lily's eyes sparkled as she observed the magical display, and even the cured villains watched in fascination, curious about the sorcery they had never witnessed before. As the symbols began to take form, a soft hum filled the air, and the atmosphere became charged with raw energy. It was as if the very fabric of reality was bending to Peter's will. The symbols coalesced into two coffin-shaped shadows, and from within them, two ethereal figures started to emerge. The figures slowly took shape, from bones to muscles, tendons, nerves, skin, and hair, they materializing into the exact replicas of Tony Stark and Natasha Romanoff. They were perfect duplicates, down to the finest detail, bearing the same appearances, clothes as their originals. A slash N. Gotta keep it PG for Lily. Whoa. Lily gasped, her excitement bubbling over. Dad, you did it. You created them. Peter smiled at his daughter's enthusiasm. Your dad's cool, huh? He replied proudly before preparing for the next ritual. Now, I need Tony and Natasha to come forward. Tony and Natasha hesitated for a moment, unsure of what to expect. They looked at each other, silently seeking reassurance. Finally, they stepped forward, drawn toward Peter and the two identical clones. Now, you both need to take a deep breath and relax, Peter instructed. I'm going to pull your astral forms from your bodies. But don't worry, you won't feel any pain. He reached out with his hands carefully manipulating the eldritch energy surrounding Tony and Natasha. He focused his willpower on their astral forms, coaxing them to separate from their physical bodies. Tony and Natasha gasped in shock as they felt a strange sensation wash over them. It was as if they were floating, weightless and intangible. They looked down and saw their own physical bodies below, lying unconscious on the floor. Oh my, we're souls, Natasha said, her voice filled with wonder. Peter nodded with a smile. Exactly. Now, stay calm and trust me. I'm going to bind your astral forms to your original bodies. With practiced precision, Peter initiated the second part of the ritual. Galthrenix Laminia Thurindal, Klaatu Barada Nikto, Kokum Tonin, Klaatu Verada Nikto, Xyron Mingtian, Bien Xinglie, Kalamat Fti, 
Ilan Sila Luman Omentielvo, and Kalaman Suishantori, Yagami Rado, Hiro Nin, Lu Govated, Coroner Boromina Miles. He chanted ancient incantations, drawing runes in the air and intertwining their energies with the astral forms of Tony and Natasha. The glowing symbols spiraled around them, connecting them to their original, physical bodies below. As the ritual reached its climax, the runes glowed brighter and brighter, until they emitted a blinding burst of light that enveloped Tony and Natasha. The light seemed to merge with their astral forms, drawing them down into their respective clone bodies. In an instant, the light subsided, leaving Tony and Natasha gasping for breath as they opened their eyes and took in their surroundings. They were now in very familiar, yet unfamiliar vessels, but they could feel a sort of pull magnetizing them toward their original bodies, which laid sprawled on the floor at Peter's feet. That was incredible! Tony exclaimed, still reeling from the experience. Natasha looked at Peter with a healthy bit of fear and wariness in her eyes. That was, she had no words to describe it. With the rituals completed and the clones successfully integrated with Tony and Natasha's astral forms, Peter took a step back, feeling a surge of satisfaction and a bit of exhaustion. He wiped the sweat from his brow, looking at his handiwork with a mix of relief and pride. Lily approached her father with a grin, full of admiration. You did it, Dad. That was so awesome. Peter chuckled, ruffling his daughter's hair affectionately. Thanks, it was my most challenging spell yet. After moving Tony and Natasha got used to their temporary bodies, it was finally time to head home. All right, that's it, I guess. Peter announced in a somber tone as he activated his storage necklace, pulling out the large cube he stole from Doctor Strange. The spell is done and everything is ready. Now we need to proceed with the next part of the plan, which is sending everyone back to their respective universes and timelines. Wait, Lily exclaimed as she held her new slime pet tightly. What about Venom? Peter's eyes widened. Oh, I almost forgot about that, he muttered. Peter had been so engrossed in the rituals that he forgot about Venom. He almost activated the cube without thinking, which would have sent the poor blob back to his universe. Tony and Natasha's original bodies are safe since the cube will only target their souls, which are currently inside the clones, but everyone else would have been sent right back to their home universe. Hmm. Peter hummed in thought as he wondered what to do about the little slime ball. After a moment of thought, he could only come up with a single solution on such short notice. Venom would have to attach to whichever host he wants to go with them, or else he'll go right back to Toby's universe. The shared connection should bypass the cube's spell. He would basically be hitching a ride in someone else's body. Peter quickly explained. I guess you'll have to attach to a host dash. Lily instantly jumped, her arms tightly wrapped around the black blob. Can I be Venom's host? She exclaimed eagerly. As the room fell into a momentary silence, Peter stared at his daughter. His heart raced with concern, but before he could utter a word, Venom spoke, a sharp teeth mouth forming on the slime. I accept your offer, Venom declared, his tone deep and otherworldly. Lily squealed in excitement, her eyes filled with a mix of curiosity and thrill. She had spent a lot of time with Venom, and was more than delighted with his acceptance. Lily wait, Peter called out, feeling a wave of apprehension washing over him. But it was too late. Before he could say anything more, Venom surged forward and engulfed Lily in his black, swirling mass. The symbiote seemed to wrap around her like a cocoon, covering her entire body. The Avengers Tower fell into a stunned silence as Lily and Venom combined, their forms intertwining. The swirling mass of the symbiote wrapped around Lily, covering her entire body. As the transformation completed, Lily's Spider-Girl suit took on a sleek black appearance, with sharp, spider-like symbols crawling across its surface. Lily's mask became Venom's face, his vicious teeth and malicious eyes now on full display. Whoa, Tom whispered, taken aback by the sight before him. Everyone, besides Toby, stared in awe at the transformation, having never seen anything quite like it in their universes. Tony was especially interested, his inquisitive, scientific eyes glued to alien symbiote. Peter, on the other hand, was overwhelmed with worry. His heart raced, and a thousand thoughts raced through his mind as he watched his daughter bound with a being as dangerous as Venom. He knew that Venom was harmless now, but he couldn't help but worry. It's what parents do. Lily, he called out, his voice tinged with concern. But before he could say anything more, Lily's mask moved and Venom spoke. Don't worry, I would never harm Lily. She offered herself willingly, and I'll protect her as my host. As Venom finished, Lily's mask retracted, revealing her unblemished face. Dad, it's okay. Venom and I are friends, so please don't make us separate. I'll take good care of him. I swear. 
She spoke as if he were a pet, which did little to quell Peter's worry, but he let out a sigh and decided to trust his daughter. He took a deep breath. All right, Lily, but please be careful, he said, his voice softening with concern. Lily nodded, her voice filled with excitement. Don't worry, Dad. I'll be fine. And Venom and I will be right here if you ever need us. Peter managed a weak smile, still grappling with the strange mixture of emotions inside him. All right, I'll trust you. But once we're back home, we're talking about this with your mom. Lily nodded in agreement, happy that her father was willing to at least consider the idea of her being Venom's host. As the room settled into a tense silence, Lily brows furrowed, realizing that she can telepathically speak to Venom. And after a moment of talking, the symbiote retreated back into Lily's body, disappearing completely. And thankfully, Lily looked the same as before, dressed in her Spider-Girl attire. A few people in the room couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy at Lily's symbiotic pet, mostly the villains, but they wouldn't say a word. MJ gave Lily a smile and said, You looked really cool, Lily. Lily grinned, genuinely excited. Thanks. I'm going to show my mom when I get home. Toby's eyes narrowed, looking at the familiar sight before him. Just be careful, all right? He was once Venom's host and it didn't end well. Peter nodded. Don't worry, I'll be watching carefully. Although it's not very likely that Venom will cause Lily trouble, he still has to be cautious. I should stock up on chocolate when I get back. After all, he didn't want Venom eating people, especially now that Lily is his host. With everyone's concerns voiced and Lily's excitement palpable, Peter knew it was time to proceed with the next part of the plan. He checked out the window and noted that the cracks on the sky were getting worse. It was time. Any longer and I'll have to make everyone forget about Tom. Peter frowned, unwilling to let that happen. He placed the cube that he had stolen from Doctor Strange onto a nearby table and turned back to face the group. All right, everyone, he said somberly. It's time for goodbyes. One by one, the members of the group said their farewells. The atmosphere in the room grew heavy with emotion as some hugged and exchanged heartfelt words. The cured villains who had now become allies, the alternate Spider-Man, and Lily with Venom all said their goodbyes with a sense of camaraderie and appreciation for the time they had spent together. Finally, it was time for Peter to activate the cube and send everyone back to their respective universes and timelines. With a deep breath, he pressed the button at the top of the cube, activating Doctor Strange's spell. A surge of energy filled the room as the spell took effect and expanded, covering the city and eventually encompassing the whole world. One by one, the members of the group vanished in flashes of light, disappearing from the Avengers Tower and returning to their own realities. Watching everyone disappear, Peter turned to Tom and gave him a wave, his body glowing in the process. I'll see you soon, so don't slack on your training, okay? Sure thing, Sensei. Tom answered, a sad tilt to his voice. Just as he was about to disappear, Peter motioned toward MJ. Oh, and be sure to use the knowledge we gave you that night. He said wiggling his eyes brows as he disappeared, leaving behind a few final words. Lose that virginity of yours before college. Did not say things like that? Tom exclaimed in embarrassment, whilst MJ blushed and looked away, avoiding his eyes. Wait, don't listen to him. Soon enough, the room was left with only Tom, MJ, May, and Ned standing together, surrounded by the echoes of their friends' departures. On the floor, Natasha and Tony's original bodies remained, waiting for their astral forms to return. Outside, the invisible cracks that threatened to break open universe itself slowly mended, disappearing completely after a few minutes. The silence that followed was heavy with the weight of their absence. MJ wiped away a tear and looked at the empty space where the others had been just moments before. I'm going to miss them, she said, her voice choked with emotion. May nodded, her eyes misty as well. Me too. Ned sighed, feeling a sense of loss. It was like we had this whole superhero team going on, and now they're all gone. Tom put his arm around MJ, offering her comfort. Yeah, but we'll always have the memories, and who knows, maybe we'll see them again someday, he says as he pulls out his new phone. Besides, we can message them anytime. May smiled at her nephew, remembering the Spider-Verse chat. You're right. Ned nodded, eyeing the phone curiously. Maybe you should ask if they got back all right? Tom agreed and opened the app. Okay, one second, Tom. Uh, hey waving hand. After disappearing from the tower, Natasha Romanoff found herself back in her own timeline, standing on the desolate planet of Vormer. Confused and disoriented, she looked around, trying to make sense of the situation. She had just said her goodbyes to her newfound friends and was ready to crash into the ground and die, but the spell seemed to have taken her back a few minutes earlier than expected. Annoyed, she realized that she was once again faced with the heart-wrenching choice she had made before. She had to fight Clint Barton, 
her dear friend and ally, to sacrifice herself and obtain the soul stone. Natasha sighed, frustrated with the annoying turn of events. She had already made peace with her decision, and now she had to go through it all over again. Seriously? Natasha muttered under her breath. I thought I was done with this part. Hawkeye approached her, his eyes filled with pain and determination. Nat, we can't do this. Let me go. It has to be me. Natasha shook her head, her resolve just as firm as before. Clint, we both know it has to be me. You have a family, a chance to get them back. I don't. This is the only way. They both knew there was no changing the outcome. The two friends had been through too much together, and now they found themselves in this cruel and agonizing predicament. They fought fiercely, each trying to save the other, but they both knew there was only one way this could end. I doubt he'll believe me if I said I won't really die. She thought, knowing Peter's spell would save her. Natasha grunted as she blocked Clint's attacks, her mind racing with frustration. She didn't want to do this all over again. She had already accepted her fate once, and now she had to face it twice. But she had a duty to fulfill, a sacrifice to make. She couldn't let Clint anywhere near the cliffside, especially now that she knows she'll survive. With renewed determination, Natasha gathered her strength and pushed herself harder in the fight. Clint, too, fought with all his might, knowing that he had to do this for Natasha, the woman he considered his sister. They exchanged blows, each strike a testament to their friendship and the love they held for one another. I'm sorry Clint, Natasha said between breath, but I'll be fine, so don't worry. Clint's eyes filled with tears as he replied, and I'm sorry too, Nat, but I can't let you. The battle reached its climax, and Natasha found herself at the edge of the cliff, looking back at Clint, who laid on the ground, beaten and defeated. The battle was decided yet again. Natasha hesitated for a moment, a small smile gracing her lips. I love you, Clint, she whispered, her voice choked with emotion. And I'll see you soon. Clint's heart broke, and tears streamed down his face. I love you too. With one final look, Natasha jumped off the cliff for the second time, trusting that Peter's spell would do its work. As she fell, Natasha's mind flashed with the memories of her life as an Avenger. She smiled through her tears, grateful for the bond she had formed and the love she had experienced. If the spell fails, then this isn't such a bad way to go out, she thought. In that moment, Natasha felt a sense of peace. She had found a family in her friends, and that love would live on in her heart, even in death. And as the famous Black Widow's life came to an end with a sickening splat, her body remained unmoving at the bottom of the cliff. But moments later, a faint wisp of light could be seen, shooting out of her body and disappearing over the horizon. Tom, May, MJ, and Ned stood in the Avengers Tower, their hearts heavy with the weight of their friends' departures. They were anxious and worried, waiting for Tony and Natasha's souls to return to their bodies. Time seemed to slow down as they watched Natasha's lifeless form lying on the floor, hoping for any sign of her return. Minutes passed, feeling like hours, and just when they were starting to lose hope, a faint wisp of light shot into the room and merged with Natasha's body. Did you see that? MJ exclaimed, her eyes widening in surprise. Ned nodded, excitement and hope welling up within him. I think that was it. Natasha's soul just came back. Tom's heart skipped a beat, and he rushed over to Natasha's side, closely followed by May, MJ, and Ned. They watched with bated breath as Natasha's body twitched, her eyes fluttering open. Natasha gasped for breath, her body jerking as life returned to it. She blinked a few times, disoriented and confused, before finally focusing on the worried faces surrounding her. Natasha! Tom exclaimed, relief washing over him. May's eyes were glistening with tears, happy that everything was working out. Welcome back! Natasha took a deep breath, her memories flooding back. She remembered the fight with Clint, the fall, and then, nothing. I, I'm alive, she whispered, almost unable to believe it. Ned practically jumped in excitement. Peter's spell actually worked. Natasha managed a weak smile, still a little disoriented. What, what about Tony? She asked as all eyes turned to Tony's body, which continued to lay lifeless on the cold hard floor. As Tony Stark descended down to face Thanos, he felt a rush of familiarity. He had been in this exact situation before, with the Infinity Stones in his possession, ready to face the Mad Titan. But something felt different this time, as he landed and saw Thanos in front of him, his gauntlet still adorned with the stones, it dawned on him that Peter's spell must have sent him back a few minutes earlier than he had anticipated. Great, Tony muttered annoyed. I just had to deal with this once, and now I have to do it all over again. Thanos turned to face him, a grin forming on his face. You again, he taunted. I thought you learned your lesson last time. Tony chuckled, brushing off the comment. Yeah, well, I've got a bad habit of coming back for more. Without further ado, 
the two engaged in battle once more. However, just like before, it was a one-sided affair. Tony's frustration over having to repeat this fight coupled with the knowledge of what was to come gave him a sense of recklessness. He fought with all his might, but he couldn't match the raw power of the Mad Titan. Blows rained down on Tony's suit, denting and cracking the once impenetrable armor. He struggled to keep up, but he refused to back down. Even though he knew the outcome, he fought with every ounce of strength he had left. As the battle continued, Thanos kept the upper hand, his immense strength overwhelming Tony's efforts to fight back. Soon, Tony found himself pinned against the ground, his in armor and body in tatters. You're no match for me, Stark, Thanos said with a wicked grin. Your persistence is commendable, but it won't change the outcome. No matter what you do, I will always be. Inevitable. Tony, panting heavily, managed to speak through the pain. I'm not giving up that easily. As Thanos lifted Tony by the throat, ready to deliver the final blow, Tony repeated history once again. He discreetly activated his nanobot Iron Man suit, which extended its tendrils, silently reaching for the infinity stones on Thanos' gauntlet. With precise movements, the nanobots started detaching the stones one by one. Thanos, unaware of Tony's actions, continued to taunt him. You should have gone for the head like last time. With all the infinity stones now safely in his iron glove, Tony smirked triumphantly. Well, this time, I'll do better than that. Thanos frowned in confusion as Tony lifted his hand, revealing all six infinity stones. What was it you said again? Tony asked with a shit-eating grin plastered across his face. Oh, I remember. It's... I'm inevitable. With a smug look, Tony snapped his fingers together, activating the infinity stones, and the universe erupted in a blinding light. The ground shook, and everything around them seemed to disappear into a void of pure energy. As the blinding light engulfed them, Tony Stark felt the toll the stones took on his body. Unadulterated pain and agony filled his entire being, engulfing him completely. And with that pain came a rush of emotions. Memories of everything he had fought for, his friends, his family, and the world he loved, flooded his mind. It was all coming to an end once more, but this time, there was a small sliver of hope that Peter's spell would work, allowing him to reunite with his family and friends once again. But as the light subsided and the echoes of Thanos' defeat faded away, Tony found himself alone on the battlefield with no sign of Thanos or his army. The universe around him seemed different, altered. Did it work? He muttered as he collapsed on the ground, his body fried from using the stones. As he looked down at his gloved hand, the one that held the infinity stones, he knew that something had changed. The stones were gone, and he could feel the lingering power within him. Tony's mind raced with possibilities. Did I succeed? However, before he could find any answers, a feeling of exhaustion washed over him. The strain of wielding the Infinity Stones took its toll, and Tony's body started to give in to the immense power he had just harnessed. As the dust settled and Thanos's army disappeared, Pepper Potts watched in horror as the blinding light dissipated, revealing the aftermath of the battle. Her heart pounded in her chest as she searched desperately for Tony, praying that he had survived the onslaught as well. Tony, she called out, her voice trembling with fear. Moments later, she spotted him, collapsed on the ground, his Iron Man suit battered and broken. Pepper's heart sank as she rushed towards him, pushing past the debris that littered the battlefield. Her eyes locked onto his face, which was pale and filled with a mixture of pain and exhaustion. Tony, she cried out again, falling to her knees beside him. Are you okay? Tony managed a weak smile, though the effort seemed to drain the last of his energy. Hey Pep, he said, his voice barely a whisper. I did it. I made things right. Pepper's eyes filled with tears as she gently cradled Tony's face in her hands. You did, Tony, she said, her voice choked with emotion. You did. Tom, who had rushed over, looked on in shock. Mr. Stark, you did it, he said, noticing Tony's horrible condition. Hey, are you okay? Tony chuckled softly, his breaths growing shallow. No, I don't think I am, he replied, looking at Tom with a mix of pride and exhaustion. But I'll be back, so just wait for me. Pepper's tears fell freely now as she held Tony close, confused by his words. Jay just hang in there, okay, she pleaded. We can find a way to heal you. Just don't die. Please, don't die. Tony shook his head gently, his strength waning. It's too late for that, Pep, he said, his voice barely audible. I knew what I was getting into. And I'd do it all over again if it meant keeping you and our daughter safe. Pepper's heart shattered as she realized the gravity of the situation. No, Tony, please, she sobbed, unable to accept what was happening. But Tony's gaze remained steady as he looked at her lovingly. I love you, Pepper, he whispered. Always have, always will. Just wait for me dash with those final, 
yet cryptic words, Tony's body went limp in Pepper's arms, and she let out a heart-wrenching cry of anguish. Tom placed a hand on her shoulder and joined her. His expression filled with sorrow as well. He did it. Dr. Strange appeared, a solemn look on his face. After all, he knew this would happen. This was the one in a million chance he was betting on, but he certainly wasn't happy about it. As Pepper grieved, Tom couldn't tear his eyes away from the fallen hero. Tony Stark, the man he had looked up to and admired, had sacrificed himself so that everyone else could live. We'll make sure that everyone knows what he did, Tom vowed, his voice filled with determination. I'll make sure they remember him, forever. Pepper looked up at Tom, gratitude shining through her tears. Thank you, she whispered, her heart heavy with loss. Together, they mourned the loss of Tony Stark, unaware that they would be seeing him in about a year's time. As the sun set on the battlefield, Pepper held Tony's lifeless body close, unaware as a dim transparent light shot out of his corpse and dashed away, disappearing into the distance. Tony, Natasha grumbled as she paced around the room. What's taking him so long? Maybe the spell couldn't bring him back? Ned spoke what everyone was thinking and received harsh glares for doing so. Natasha turned to him, furious. If you have nothing good to say, then don't speak. He'll make it back. He has to. As they waited, slowly losing hope as time passed, a faint wisp of light appeared in the night sky, like a shooting star. It swirled and danced before shooting in their direction. Is that... Ned whispered. Natasha snapped. Didn't I tell you dash? She froze as she caught sight of the wisp in the distance. The wisp of light grew closer, and within its glow, they could see the faint outline of a figure. It was Tony, his form flickering like a mirage. Natasha's eyes filled with tears. It worked! She exclaimed as the flickering figure of Tony surged at the tower and shot into his body. Tony gasped, his eyes flying open as he took in his surroundings. He was back in the tower, alive once again. After the emotional reunion at the Avengers Tower, Natasha found herself filled with a renewed sense of purpose. She knew that she had to see Clint and his family. They were the only real family she had ever been a part of, besides the Avengers. She had a niece and two nephews there that no doubt mourned her death. So, with Tony's promise to meet her later, she bid her friends farewell and slipped away into the night. Disguising herself as an air hostess, Natasha managed to sneak onto a commercial flight to Iowa without drawing any suspicion. Her many years spent as a top spy allowed her to pass all checks without a hitch. As the plane touched down, she quietly made her way out of the airport and into the parking lot, where she swiftly stole a car. Driving for hours, Natasha headed deeper and deeper into the barren areas of Iowa, where the landscape was dominated by thick forests. The familiar sights brought back memories of her time with the Barton family. They had been a part of her life for so long, and she longed to be with them once more. Finally, she arrived at Barton Farm, but she barely had a chance to step out of the car before an arrow pierced the door next to her. Whirling around, she saw Lila Barton, Clint's middle child, holding a bow and arrow. Lila, it's me, Natasha said gently, hoping her niece would recognize her. Lila's eyes widened in shock. Aunt Natasha? She exclaimed, lowering her bow hesitantly. Before Natasha could respond, another arrow whizzed past her, this time coming from the direction of the farmhouse. She turned to see Clint standing on the porch, with Laura and their other children behind him. The tension in the air was palpable. Lila, come here now, Clint commanded, concern and caution written all over his face. Lila reluctantly obeyed, and Natasha stepped forward, hoping to bridge the gap between them. However, another arrow landed at her feet, preventing her from moving any further. Clint, it's me, Natasha said, trying to sound as reassuring as possible. I'm back. I was brought back by a spell. I know how it sounds but it's true. Clint's eyes narrowed, not fully believing what he was seeing. Laura stepped forward, a mix of hope and uncertainty in her eyes. Could it be her? Clint hesitated, torn between his skepticism and his desperate desire to believe. Maybe, he muttered, turning back to Natasha. Keep your hands in the air and get down on your knees. Okay. Natasha complied easily. After tying Natasha up with some wire rope, Clint deposited her in the living room. If you so much as twitch in those ropes, I'll put an arrow between your eyes, are we clear? Natasha nodded. Crystal. Clint turns to his three kids, who were hovering around curiously. Out. All of you. Go upstairs and do your homework. He shooed them off. As they left, Natasha began to explain everything that happened. From Tom and Strange's failed spell to Peter's spell that brought her back from the dead. Clint watched her with a skeptic eye. It sounds like you've had a very magical few days. Laura, on the other hand, looked much more convinced than him. Maybe she's telling the truth? I am. Natasha sighed in annoyance. Just call Tom or Rhodes. They can explain. 
Laura nodded in agreement. We should call Fury too. Clint nodded. He should be off planet right now, but we can try. Leaving Natasha tied up for a moment, they walked to the front porch to make some calls. Back inside the house, the Barton kids gathered around Natasha, asking her questions that only their aunt Natasha would know the answers to. They talked about their childhood toys, their favorite games, and all the fun they had together. Lila held up an old stuffed animal. What's this bear's name? Felix. Natasha answered with ease, a small smile on her lips. Cooper, the oldest, stepped up next. What was the first move you taught me? He asked, taking a combat stance. A karate chop. I wanted to teach you some real fighting, like Muay Thai, but you watch too many kung fu movies and wouldn't take anything else. She answered perfectly once again. What's this? Nathaniel held up a messy child's drawing. We drew that together on your birthday. You said the squiggles in the sky were birds. Halfway through answering their questions, Clint and Laura stood outside the room, listening in with their keen ears. It might actually be her. Clint admitted in a whisper that only his wife could hear. After an hour of waiting, the unmistakable sound of a spaceship approaching filled the front yard. A bright light illuminated the surroundings, and the humming grew louder before eventually fading away. Finally, a knock came at the door, Laura and Clint exchanged glances before Laura opened the door to reveal none other than Nick Fury standing there. He wasted no time with greetings and immediately entered the living room, where Natasha was still restrained. Fury began to rattle off coded questions to Natasha, a series of statements and responses that only she could provide. I walked my dog today, he stated. Natasha understood immediately. Was he pulling at his leash again? Did you see the news this morning? He continued. Yeah, they said it would rain, so I brought an umbrella. She answered with ease. This continued for a full 30 minutes, and Natasha answered each prompt without hesitation, confirming her identity beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, damn me. Fury muttered as he ran out of prompts. It's really you. Satisfied, Fury dropped onto a nearby couch, shocked that one of his best agents actually returned from the dead. You can untie her now, Fury ordered. But just as Clint was about to untie her, Natasha simply stood up, causing the ropes to fall loosely at her feet, showing that she could have escaped at any moment. Fury chuckled at Natasha's display, finding the look on Clint's face amusing. I can't believe it's really you, he said, his voice breaking with emotion. Welcome back from the dead, I guess. Yeah, it's me, Natasha replied, her eyes shining with tears of relief. I'm back. Laura stepped forward and hugged Natasha tightly. We missed you so much, she said, her voice filled with emotion. Natasha hugged her back, cherishing the warmth of their embrace. I missed you all too, she whispered. As the rest of the family crowded around, including the children, who were hovering in the hallway, laughing and crying, they embraced their long-lost sister and aunt. The pain of the past year melted away in the comfort of each other's presence. Fury stood at the side, a small smile gracing his lips, though he knew that he'd have to get some answers soon enough. After all, people don't just come back to life. But that can wait until tomorrow, he thought as he watched the family reunion. As the hours passed, Natasha found herself overwhelmed with gratitude for Peter's help and the second chance he had given her. She was back with her family, where she truly belonged. The pain and heartache she had endured were fading away, replaced by a sense of belonging and love. Late into the night, as the stars twinkled overhead, Clint and Natasha sat together on the porch, watching the fireflies dance in the distance. I thought I lost you, Clint admitted, his voice filled with emotion. Natasha placed a reassuring hand on his shoulder. And I thought I lost you, she replied. But here we are, together again. Clint looked at her, his eyes filled with gratitude. Thank you for coming back, he said softly. Your family, Natasha. You always have been. And your family to me too, Natasha replied, her voice choked with emotion. I'll always do my best to come back. With the weight of the past year lifted from their shoulders, they sat in companionable silence, cherishing the simple joy of being together. As the sun began to rise, Natasha knew that she had found her way back home, not just to the Barton family, but to herself as well. Ahem, the door opens and Fury comes walking out, ruining the mood in an instant. This is real sweet and all, but I need some answers. Hours earlier back in New York, the night was calm as Tony approached the familiar address of his home, his heart pounding with both excitement and trepidation. A year had passed since Pepper and Morgan had seen him, and he couldn't bear the thought of the pain they had endured believing he was gone forever. The weight of the guilt weighed heavily on his shoulders, but he knew he had to face them. With a deep breath, he knocked on the door, the sound echoing through the quiet and extravagant neighborhood. He heard the shuffling of footsteps on the other side, and his heart skipped a beat when the door opened to reveal Pepper standing there, 
looking both shocked and hopeful. T. Tony, she whispered, her voice quivering. Tony managed a weak smile. Hey, Pep, he said softly. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.